Okay, we are going to get started now. Welcome to our first board meeting of the year. We thought we'd start off with a nice, easy topic tonight. So thank you all for coming. Uh, first order of business is roll call. Pete Constant. Here. Julie Hirota. Here. Heidi Hall. Here. Marla Franz. Here. Ludmilla Karkovs. Okay, will now join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As we get going to tonight's meeting, you'll have multiple opportunities for public comment. If you'd like to make a comment on something that is not on our agenda, you'll ask to speak for item 1.5. Please fill out one of these speaker cards. You'll have three minutes to address the board. For items on the agenda, same card. We have one item essentially to speak on, 3.1. Uh, because of the number of speakers that we have, uh, comments will be limited to 90 seconds, so half of the time. Now, as we get going here, first I want to welcome everyone to Antelope High School, home of one of our wonderful student board members, Felina. Thank you for hosting us at your school. We appreciate it. And we also have our other board member, Kamea, from West Park High School. As we mentioned at our last meeting, this year we are going to tackle a number of significant issues that have been put on the back burner, or some may say kicked down the road for a while. Um, and today is our first of those days um, on addressing those issues. But we have big issues like the curriculum and instruction materials that we'll be talking about today, library materials, which we'll be talking about at a future meeting, the definition of equity and the equity policy for the district, and of course, a discussion about our attendance areas and attendance boundaries. All of those will be significant issues that we talk about. Um, and as we go forward, we will do our best to focus on process so that we can make sure all voices are heard, make sure that we're addressing all of our policies and following our policies to the best of our ability. Tonight, again, this is our first step of our board being really intentional and deliberate on taking on these significant topics because they're topics that we have a lot of interest both from our students, from our parents, from our teachers, from our staff, and we owe it to all of you to address these issues, make sure that everybody's concerns are heard and that we ultimately um, come down on policies that are gonna best serve the most people in our district. One of those key things is making sure that we follow our board policy on establishing board policies. And that's something that uh, we haven't always done, but we're pledging as a board that we are going to do that. And the board policy says that when you have these big issues, you have a public discussion about it, you delve into the issue, get the details that we need to kind of decide if we're in the right ballpark or things need to be changed or if there's something really rises to the level of a new policy and then direct our professional staff in how to address that policy. They'll go out, do their research. They'll bring those policies back to us for a second airing with the public, with our faculty, with our staff, so that we can then decide ultimately what the policy is. As we go through all of these contentious issues, I just ask that you remember why we are all here. We are here to educate students. And in doing so, we have multiple different objectives that we have to meet. Uh, and I think if we all focus on why we're here and the ultimate goal, we will come up with the best policies. Now, I don't want you to hold back, and we really want to hear what your opinions are on all of these things, um, but we ask that you do it in a respectful manner and that we listen to all sides. 
be open to what other people have to say, because as I said, we have these controversial topics and we do need to address them, um, but we don't have to do it in a negative manner. So this will be our first opportunity tonight. I look forward to that discussion when we get to it on the agenda, but I just wanna thank you all and uh, thank you for being here and thank you in advance for the great discussion that we are going to have. With that, we're gonna get right into our public comments. I have three people who've requested to speak at public comment. I'll call all three in order. Shemaine Phillips, Sandy Marquez, and Renee Rogers. So if you can make your way up to the podium here for your three, minute, three minutes of public comment. And just a reminder, these are for issues that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, just before you start the timer, just so you know, the agenda item that I'm speaking on is about the law and policy. So that I'm focusing on law and policy for agenda and something sort of parallel, but not quite. Okay. A new narrative has emerged in our district. In an effort to intimidate and silence some parents, teachers, and students while brainwashing and influencing others. Trust the teachers. We are the professionals. We have been trained to know what's appropriate for our students. One thing has become very clear in the last few months. Some, not all teachers, and administrators in RJUHSD have forgotten their role. Tonight I stand here representing a large group of parents and students district-wide who do not want to come and who do not feel comfortable speaking up. They also hesitate to send emails with their thoughts. Why? Because they fear retaliation from the teachers. <clears throat> yes, this is the culture some teachers, principals, and administrators in this district have created, a culture of fear. And if you think retaliation doesn't happen in this district, you're sadly mistaken. The other reason they don't come is because they expect the board members, administrators, and teachers to do the job they were elected or hired to do. Protect our students from pornographic material that doesn't teach literacy and only approve the te and teach materials that prepare them to be college and career ready. So let me begin on behalf of those students and parents by sending a message loud and clear to those teachers, union reps, and administrators who are pushing this narrative about the culture you are nurturing. The kids in this district are not your students. They are our students. We, the parents, are responsible for their outcome. Verbal and visually sexually explicit pornographic materials have no place inside a classroom or a school setting funded by taxpayer money. Parents who want their children reading those materials have access through other resources. Teachers that are not trained psychologists nor professionals in issues of rape, sexual abuse, pedophilia, molestation, sexual dysphoria, and other horrifying topics um, that are being currently thrust upon our students. Educational materials which push an ideology riddled in socialism, Marxism, and tenets of critical race theory violate the law and do nothing to accurately prepare our students to be college and career ready. To the teachers who educate with the ethical fundamentals of literacy, math, and English, in history, which actually prepares students to be college and career ready, we support and thank you. To the Let Them Read t-shirt parents, who know, no one is asking the board to take away your students' right to read, sexually explicit, inappropriate, or unfactual books if you choose, but you are taking away our rights to a high quality, rigorous education. <clears throat> to the teacher, teachers pushing your ideologies, please step back in your lane and, and stop grooming our kids. Then we will trust and respect you. And lastly, to the board, Please do the job that the community elected you to do. Please protect our students from false narratives, false ideologies, and pornographic materials with no factual basis and ensure all materials make some college and career ready. Thank you. Thank you. Next up will be Sandy Marquez, followed by Renee Rogers. Hello. I just wanted to come and be positive and say um, Happy New Year and congratulations to everyone who got a seat here to um, represent the children and the parents um, in this process of educating our children. So uh, thank you for taking this responsibility on. Um, and I just want to let you know that I'm praying for you guys to make the right choices for the children and to respect parental rights. So I pretty much echo what the young lady said uh, ahead of me. Um, we need to pick things that are appropriate for the children so that they can become college ready 
and be productive, contributing citizens in our society. So thank you so much again, and know that you are prayed for. Thank you. Renee Rogers. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to read is a little offensive, so if there's kids, I would probably think about before I read this. Um, and the reason I'm reading is I want it on the record of what's been approved. And then also, I'm going to be making some public records requests because we have to know the chain of how it actually got here. Um, and I, I'm going to tell you, this is extremely offensive. It does not give me any gratitude whatsoever of wanting to read this. I don't want to read this any more than anyone wants to hear it. His attentions, therefore, gradually settled on those humans whose bodies were le least offensive, children. And since he was too, <coughs> excuse me, since little boys were insulting, scary, and stubborn, he further limited his interest to little girls. They were usually manageable and frequently seductive. His sexuality was anything but lewd. His patronage of little girls smacked of innocence and was associated in his mind with cleanliness. The little girls are the only things I'll miss. Do you know that when I touched their sturdy little tits and bit them just a little, I felt like it was being friendly. <laughs> I gave them mint money and they ate ice cream with their legs wide open while I played with them. It was like a party. There wasn't any nastiness, there wasn't any filth, and there wasn't any odor, there wasn't any groaning. Just the light, white laughter of little girls and me. And I can go on. There are pages of this, and I'm going to give you guys for the record. Somehow, a teacher or group of teachers suggested this as reading for your students, for our kids. And somehow got approved in that process. So I'm asking for two things as a public records request. I'm going to leave my email with you guys. I'd like to know the teachers that did recommend it, because we are not okay with any adult reading this to our kids. If there was a coach reading this to our kids, let's say one kid sitting alone with our child reading this book, we would be calling the police on them. Just because it's in a group setting with a bunch of kids is required material for language arts does not bypass the fact that this is pedophilia and grooming. Does not. And also, I'm, if there is a lawsuit being threatened on this district, I want public records of the emails of the ones that are threatening to not have these books banned because we need to know the people that are perpetrating on our children. We have a right to know, we need to know the organizations, and the public has the right to know of who these organizations and people are that are wanting this type of material influenced onto our kids. Thank you. So that is our last public speaker. I'll just comment that if public records requests are not taken verbally, make sure you put that in writing and send it to the district superintendent and we will respond to that. Last call for public comments for items not on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll get into our agenda. The next item is the <clears throat> appointment of district committees. It's not in the board packet, but it was distributed at the beginning of this meeting and it is on the table out front. The proposed um, assignments for standing committees, liaisons, and county office of education committees. We have any comment, concern, if not a motion on the proposed assignments. We have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second. We have a second. Any discussion? Okay, we'll start first with an advisory vote from our student board members. Kamea, you first. Yes, okay. So we have two yeses from both of our board members. <clears throat> All in favor from the board say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None that passes unanimously. Thank you.
Have fun on your new assignments. We'll now get into the main event, the, the one item that we have on our agenda, item 3.1, curriculum and instructional materials approval process. So before we get started, let me sort of set the table for what this is and what this isn't. Uh, what we plan to do today is, as I mentioned earlier, what the first step in our process for reviewing or establishing policies is have an open public discussion about either the existing policy or the need for a new policy to seek information and understanding on the issues surrounding that and provide an initial direction, direction to staff if we uh, would like to see any changes in our policy. As we know, we work in an environment on school boards where there's a number of state laws that some would say guide, other would say direct us in how we are to operate in our district. Uh, those laws exist in the government code, in the education code, and elsewhere. Tonight, what we hope to do is take a look at those laws or the frameworks in which we operate as a school board. Take also a look at our board policy that we have in place that has been in place for a while on how we deal with curriculum and instruction materials. Take a look at our administrative regulation, which is the instructions to our professional staff on how to implement those policies, and then also talk about our current practices to see if they align with our board policy and with the state law. We're not here tonight to make any changes tonight. I know we got a lot of emails, people worried about what the change may be tonight. There will not be a change tonight. We are here to seek information, understanding, and give direction on the next steps. So I just wanna make that really clear. There will be no decision tonight on changes to our board policy. Now we may find that there is a gap between ed code and our policy. We may find that there's a gap between our policy and our administ administrative regulation, or there's a gap between our administrative regulation and our practices. That's what we're here to find out. And if there are changes that need to be made, then we will provide direction on how we would like to see those changes made. Not necessarily what changes we want, but what direction we wanna to take to change those in the future. People have emailed asking why we are going to have teachers participate in the board portion and the board discussion of this. And it's quite simple. They are the ones who have been crafting our curriculum and teaching from our curriculum. Just like any government agency, when you look at a particular policy or something that's happening in your organization, you should be asking those who do the work, how are you doing your work? Why do you do your work this way? So that we can understand those practices. That is the purpose of it. It is not to give teachers a unfair advantage in having more time to speak. It is to have the board have the opportunity and the resources in our teachers to answer the questions we may have. So I just wanted to lay that out so people understand why we are doing what we're doing and also to understand the process and our objectives tonight. So I'm gonna first ask my board members, any questions on the process that we're gonna to follow tonight or the objectives? Okay. With that, I'm gonna turn it over, I believe, to April and April is gonna get us started. Okay, thank you, President. Constant, and we'll wait for the PowerPoint to come up. Oh, well, I guess it is here. Great. Um, in the board documents, you have a variety of materials. Those same materials have been provided here at the table for your convenience in printed fashion. So just in case the people in the audience are wondering what we're looking at, it's the same things that we already have um, attached to the board item on the agenda. And you, as part of those exhibits, we have a variety of education codes and the policy. And what I thought I might do is highlight a few of those. I know you've all had a chance to review these in preparation for today. This is a great time for us to discuss what do these mean, um, kind of that background before we talk about how our district implements them. And um, so I'll just highlight a few of them in the slides um, up here on the screens. So EDCO defines a few of the terms that we use, one of which is basic instructional materials, what we use in the classroom for learning. 
and that meet the course. So we have course outlines, which we'll talk about, and then we have the materials to teach the course. Um, the state provides a curriculum framework as well as standards. So the standards, what are the learning targets? What should our students learn at the end of that grade level? They should be able to know and do certain things. And then they provide frameworks on how we might teach it. But those frameworks are guidelines. They're not mandates and they help to guide us in what does research say about how we teach, for example, science or math or language arts, or you name the subject, the state has um, frameworks that guide what that, how we do it. And then the instructional materials is actually defined in education code is again, those materials to support learning, the learning resources that we use in the classroom. And you can see the long definition here on the slide. So then it also refers specifically to supplementary instructional materials. And that's specifically the things that aren't core, but they enhance the learning in a course. So more complete coverage. So you may have a textbook, which we would consider core, and additional materials to enhance, to provide a variety of levels and accessibility, for example, for diverse needs of students, um, and meeting relevant, if it's technology, if it's current um, events that just engage our students. So not only a static textbook, but there are other supplementary materials that are in use in a typical classroom across the, across the country. And so then we look at some of the other codes that help guide us in selection and approval of those materials. Um, so again, we have the definition of instructional materials that I referenced. Um, there's a reference to what is the role of a parent, what is the role of a teacher, and again, we're citing the ed code here on the slide, so 60002, we want substantial teacher involvement. So each district board shall provide for substantial teacher involvement in the selection of instructional materials and, it's not an or, and shall promote the involvement of parents and other members of the community in the selection of instructional materials. So that's part of the government code that we're charged with implementing and aligning our work with. It also references the role of the board in this process. And the CDE has additional guidance in this space, but governing boards of school districts shall adopt instructional materials. So that means you'll have a course outline and you'll provide the instructional materials that are needed to teach the course. We wouldn't have only an outline. We're going to have, the whether it's core or supplemental, we'll have adopted materials for the teacher to be able to use to teach the course. Um, and that is specifically in um, Ed Code 60040. Before you move on, can I ask you a question? Please. I know you and I spoke about this before, the use of the word shall there. Um, this can be read in two different ways. So I'd like you to clarify what that shall means and how it is how it has been used and interpreted previously. Yes, so the way the state actually interprets it and they have q, q a frequently asked questions for us to look at we can't not have instructional materials for a course so when they're saying shall the way it's implemented in our state is it means you can't only have an outline and say oh we're, this is we're going to learn all these great things but not have a textbook or some other material. You can't not have instructional material. So it's not forcing your hand as a board, you must approve X, Y, or Z. Um, that was one, one, one concern that it might be interpreted that way. The interpretation is really that you can't not have instructional materials. And you may recall every September or the very beginning of October, but within the first eight weeks of the school year, we certify and you pass a resolution certifying that we have core instructional materials in the core subjects that the state identifies in ed code and it's called the sufficiency of materials resolution that we pass certifying that we have enough instructional materials for the courses for our students in those courses um, and that's just part of the work of a school district so we couldn't say oh sorry we decided not to adopt a science textbook Okay. They're not saying which science textbook we have to adopt, but we can't not have instructional materials for a course. And that's what they mean by the shall here, and that's how it's implemented in our state. And thank you for that clarification. So 
Again, just to summarize, we have a variety of terms that we use. So when we talk to our teachers or you hear um, through our process, we're referencing a lot of these in the development of courses and in selection of instructional materials. What are the state standards that we're teaching to the students should be learning? What is the framework that guides us? It's not a mandate, but a guide. And then we come up with our own um, curriculum, which are course documents like that outline and select a textbook and possibly other instructional materials to support the learning in that class. And those are the four key terms or categories involved in the process. So with that, um, I didn't put on the slide the actual text of it, but you have it in the, um, the last two exhibits on the item. We have board policy 6141 and then the accompanying administrative regulation 6141 that are how our district policy and regulations outline what we do. And I thought this might be a good opportunity to pause and discuss um, comments, questions, specifically around the ed code and our current policy before we get into the logistics. Thank you. We'll start with our student board members. Do either of you have questions on what's been presented so far or the board policies that we have? Okay. With that, I'll ask my colleagues on the board any questions for what we have seen so far? No. I have one question. Um, and I, if you're getting to this later, um, just let me know. We can hear it later. Has all of our curriculum throughout our all of our sites and all of our subjects been board approved? No, <laughs> not that I have evidence of. And we will get to kind of a historical of where are we in this current process, um, but we don't have evidence that that has happened for all of our courses at this time. Okay, thank you. And in preparation for the meeting, I know you had a, an opportunity to look through um, primarily the board policy 6141 as we talked about. Is there anything that you see in our policy that is distinctly different gaps or overlaps from what we have seen in these ed codes that you've presented to us? No, actually, I think our policy is, is up to date. There's no significant changes recommended by the state or the California School Boards Association that we look at for guides. Um, the policy is general enough to allow for us to make adjustments as well um, as we look at how that implementation happens, but we did not see any significant um, changes recommended there. And the only thing I would highlight from the regulation that we might consider changing in a future update is just simply that last sentence. Um, with our policies, we've updated the form and we've discontinued putting all the forms in our board policy. So when I reviewed these two documents, that was really the only change that I would recommend is following our protocol of removing forms um, because we do update them and rather than having them locked in. Thank you. Last chance, opportunity for questions before we move on. Uh, when you say forms, are you referring to the 6141E PDF? That's correct. And you're thinking about eliminating that? Or yes, wait, eliminating it as a board uh, form in policy because we update, we have forms, we use them in silts, we'll talk about, you know, but we've updated the forms and so that refers to an older generation form that is not as comprehensive as what we're using currently. Um, one thing that I would just, maybe we can discuss later, this, this form says new course or restructuring proposal. And one thing I wanted to talk, make sure we talked about was we approve new courses, but we never discuss when courses are removed. So I just want to throw that out there to make sure we're... It's Thank you. And I can give a little bit more explanation on why the policy committee recommended taking forms out. And one of the main reasons is the board policy is designed to be what the five of us as a unit believe are the proper policies for our district. The administrative regulations are the directions to our superintendent and staff. This is how you carry them out. The form is really an administrative tool of staff to follow that administrative regulation. So it doesn't really make sense for us to tell them how to do their administrative job. We give them 
the instructions of what we want them to accomplish and how they should bring things back to us or execute what we've done. Uh, but we believed from the policy board and ultimately the board approved that as we move forward is let them figure out how to do what we've asked them to do in an administrative manner versus us deciding whether a PDF form should have one more section for them to ask one more piece of information. Anything else before we move on? Okay, we're ready to move on. All right, thank you. So a year and a half ago, when Mr. Becker and I took our current positions, I had the opportunity to work with staff to see where are we currently in our curriculum um, situation, our status. In fact, it, you may recall it was a priority of the board at that time to look at our curriculum. There were specific courses that were uh, we were wondering about, but just the whole process, um, let, let's look at it. And so October of 2021, um, we presented, here's the new process we're going to move forward with. Um, but as a part of that process and moving forward, we did an audit of where are we currently in our district curriculum. And as of July of 2021, this is what we found. We had over 700 courses on the books. On the books meaning they existed in our student information system, were available for our schools to schedule. Uh, many of them were in use, some of them were no longer in use. 704 courses on the books. And less than 15% of those we had evidence of the board approving. Now, I don't know for a fact if the board maybe approved them 50 years ago. Our district has a long-standing reputation of excellence. We've existed for a long time. What we don't have are excellent records going back those 100 plus years showing when, I'll throw out an example of an English 9 course, when was it approved by the board and what version was approved. And what we did know is that since whatever point of its inception, the courses had changed over time, they were updated as is appropriate to become current, to make sure we were engaging our students, keeping up with state standards. But we did not have evidence of board approval throughout um, each of those courses. So again, in the realm of 15%, and I've actually checked with some of my predecessors as well, and that resonated and that was their understanding as well of our status. Um, textbooks, however, was a different story. We absolutely have core textbooks approved with board approval dates, and it has to do with that September resolution that I mentioned previously. Every um, beginning of every school year, we certify to the state. The state checks for that information in our audits that happen usually annually. It's part of our Williams audits, if you remember those terms, but we have to certify our instructional materials for the core courses that meet all for all of the students that we're serving. So textbooks, we, yes, board has approved them. We have evidence, documentation, and we were in good shape on core textbooks. Supplemental materials were a different story. Um, we did not have a process for approving or for the board approving supplemental materials. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of it is that we did not have a formal process for them to come to the board for approval. Um, it also, they were often decided at the site level. They were site funded. So we didn't have a centralized district structure of awareness, auditing, approval. They, teachers and sites were making determinations often with input at the site level. Um, what do we need to serve our students? And that's just where we were as of July of 2021. Um, in addition, we had committees um, sometimes called SILT, sometimes called SED, so the name may have changed over the years, but we had a curriculum and instruction committee that met to go through these processes. And it may have ended there or it may have gone to the board. So in the three years prior to 2021 July, we did show that in those three years, new courses were coming all the way through a district committee to the board for approval. It's that prior to three years before that point that it's really hard to, to check. We weren't using board docs for all of our documentation. We had switched systems at that point. So just the archives and the access to the documents is 
questionable and we just don't have that evidence. Um, but there was a committee. It seemed to have very limited involvement of parents. So if and when it happened, there was just maybe one or two or three based on the information that we have. It, so it wasn't very robust. And so you'll recall in October of 2021, that's when we said, okay, we're going to revamp our process. And we made some changes at that point. Comments or questions? Right, we have a very small interactive piece for you in tonight's meeting and I would like to invite our board members to come up the five board members we have five poster boards up here so if you could humor me it's gonna be a very brief moment but I'm gonna ask you to join and just stand next to one random doesn't matter what stand next to one of the poster boards please <laughs> All right. So each one of these poster boards is a stage in the process. Uh, students, you can help. Help. Why don't you help our our board members and be their guides? If you would take the it the poster, turn it around, and I'd like you to organize yourself in the order you think we are currently having our process. So feel free to move. And we're going to go left to right. So where Marla's standing should be the first stage in the process. And on the right where Heidi is, that should be the last stage in the process. What are we currently doing since October 2021 for our curriculum? Thank you very much. I'm going to have our students stay up here for just a moment. And I appreciate you, your interaction in this, because you can see there's not necessarily one right or wrong way. This is just how are we doing it right now. And there may be a better way, and that's part of the direction that we're looking from you tonight. So if we could bring the slides back up, I'll actually show you what did we... What have we been doing since October? And what we shared at the time was this process, where it actually starts with, and I'm gonna ask the students if you could just rearrange them to follow this version. It's a very slight adjustment. Um, we currently start with the site and then content. And what I love is that what made sense to you was actually the opposite, and that is one of the changes that we might consider, is are we doing them in the right order? Does it make sense to start at the site, or really should we start with the content area leads? And that's, that's a really great question that, that we'd love to engage in. Thank you, students. So I'll step back for a moment um, to the flow chart. And so one of the things that we put into place is this flow of a new course. And if it's brand new, um, it would go through this process that we just talked about, and I'll go in a little more detail. Um, it'll then be implemented. So we'll pick a CTE, a new CTE course that we've just put through. So we write it up. The teacher creates the document, writes it up, brings it through a process, and then teaches the course for the first time. And after teaching the course, you learn a lot. You find out what works, what doesn't, and there's often adjustments that are indicated because you put it on paper and it sounded great, but once you start teaching it, we want to update it. So the idea is after initial implementation, it would be reviewed to see, okay, what do we need to adjust from that course that sounded good on paper? Um, are there other materials that we actually needed to use to teach the course effectively to our students? There's this update process. 
And if those updates are significant, we would have it come back all the way through the board because if it's a significant change, we want the board to approve it. Now, if it's a typo or a very insignificant change, that we wouldn't bother with. Um, but any of those significant ch changes would come here and we'd continue implementation and we're anticipating that the course would be reviewed every three to five years. So it's not a one and done, um, which seems to be, again, part of what we had been before. So for those three years prior to July, we saw new courses coming forward for approval. What we didn't see was what is the review cycle for our existing courses, and if there are changes, how are those making it through the process? And I'll just be really clear, courses were updated. Our teachers were absolutely being current, helping students learn. We were doing great things. We just didn't have a full and complete transparent process to get those all the way through to board approval. Um, so that's what we, we shared in October. Um, this was the protocol that we started at that time. Um, and we've been implementing it for a little over a year. Um, so again, we talked about 704 courses. We updated our forms to be more complete, to answer more questions that we were getting to make sure we had all the information. Um, and we are in the process of updating our existing courses. So last year, what we started really was with new courses. Okay, we're updating our process, any new courses coming through, we're getting to try it out, go through the process, but we also knew with only 15% of them approved, we really have this big backlog of courses that all need to come through the process. And so we've been starting as we're ready, as maybe new textbooks are being adopted, those would be ready to be updated more than others. Um, we can't do all 704 at once. Um, we just had a teacher work day, January 9th, where we, again, continued this work. We're working with teacher teams in their departments to help us categorize what are we teaching in these subjects, how do we update, how do we create these forms, and ultimately we anticipate a pipeline of bringing them forward for board adoption. Um, and we also have implemented, as of this school year, our subject area teams are meeting regularly. So prior to this school year, um, we would select which subjects were going to meet in their curricular teams, typically monthly, at least quarterly, to have those conversations. But it was, okay, which five subjects get to meet this year? Well, we have a lot more than five subject areas. And so it might be, oh, I'm sorry, world language teachers, you're not up this year. And so we wouldn't have a district committee for them. Um, and so it was really hard to keep a review cycle or to keep current or to help develop teachers and support them in their areas of, of design. And so as of this year, we have actually implemented that in all subject areas so that we can have that review cycle. We can support this work across the board and we int intend to continue that. We added community input as part of this process. So you see where it says um, site review. Um, there's a big piece of what that looked like. We included school site council as part of that site review. We revitalized SILT, the curriculum and instruction leadership team, um, with two invited parents per school. And ha we're ha regularly having you know, 40 plus participants in the meetings, um, monthly meetings going through um, these types of review. Um, Marla Franz has been an integral um, board liaison to that process. And um, because we were also getting questions like, what if they weren't the board or the um, site rep in the committee? How do they have input and access? And so we added surveys as well. So we have surveys on the school site council agendas so that anyone can provide input even if they aren't able to come to the meeting and surveys on the SILT agendas. So same thing, even if they're not on the committee, they can provide input that is then shared with the folks in the room. So we've tried to expand that. Um, and so that is just a little bit more of the history of where we were in, in July. Before you go on, in regards to the community input, what type of outreach have we done to sort of promote that input? Has it been a formal, process of outreach or has it been sort of on an ad hoc basis so far? 
So the school site council agendas are um, shared at the school sites and on websites. Um, I don't know, I'm looking to our principals if they send out emails of, hey, the agenda's posted. I, I don't know that to be the case. Um, and with SILT, I know that we broadly send out those agendas to all staff. Um, I'm looking at Jen, do we send it out beyond staff? I don't think so at this time. We, right, so we have websites and access. Um, so in addition to the formal um, committee members, of course, all receive it and they know about it. And then if people are asking, we're sharing that, but that's been the extent of our outreach at this time. Thank you. All right, one um, more piece of what we've done, I'd like to share on the slides. And then I'll get to some feedback, because one of the things we did in preparation for tonight's meeting was to go to these groups that we've been working with and say, okay, how is it working? And what feedback do we have? And I'd love to share that with you as well. Um, but one of the things um, we put out in last January, so a year ago, we put out um, a memo to staff about tiers of instructional materials. And in that memo, talking about the process that we had put in place, talking about the approval, um, we outlined three types of instructional materials. We called tier one core and used across the board. We called tier two site supplemental, and it would go through school site council, and we called tier three individual teacher um, just in time. So the example we used is, um, okay, the, the Queen of England passed away. I may be a history teacher covering world events that may be appropriate to the course that I'm teaching. I don't need to go to a multi-month course approval to pull in an article or an, a news clip or whatever it may be to uh, um, talk about this current event in my classroom. That's that just-in-time curricular resources, materials that our teachers um, were able to use and are encouraged to use to make their learning relevant. Um, the idea was if things became more standardized and used across the board, used over time, it would go up into that tier two or one in this case. Um, and just in full transparency, and you'll see in the next comments, tier two is, is a very vague gray space. And so uh, more, most of our questions honestly came in, is it tier two, is it tier one, how does this work? And um, we've had some board questions or comments in open session previously about this space as well. So that's probably one of the most confusing elements. And as um, for clarity and transparency, for the last couple of months, we've actually moved away from using tier two because wanting to be more formal, and so we're really more using the tier one and three at this point, um, just because there's a lot of question and confusion, so that's one of the things that we would like to clarify moving forward, um, again, with board direction. Did you have a comment or question? Yes. Um, in tier one, you have documents include core and supplemental materials use district-wide, and then you then you reference your, we're going away with, potentially going away with tier two. You also have the supplemental materials listed there. So does each site currently have some supplemental materials list that's separate from the tier one supplemental list, or is it just confusing, which is what you already alluded to? A little bit of everything. Um, I will say out of an abundance of caution, our sites have been more putting things on what has already come to the boards. You know, like last March, we had a long list of over 900 items that came to the board. So um, I think because there was this trend of let's just err on the side of caution and transparency, um, we've been more operating in that tier one space. Um, but then there was some uh, confusion at sites around tier two. So there had been some things that had gone to school site councils that then was questioning, do we purchase? Are we ready to use or not? And we've cautioned our sites at this point. Let's not, in fact, all right now pending tonight's uh, meeting, we've delayed a lot of new implementation. And even I've delayed putting out clarifying memos just because we wanted to have this conversation, see what questions, direction, um, may be indicated as next steps, and then, then we'll be ready to clarify. Um, so we've kind of paused on the tier two. I don't know that there are tier two in, in play in classrooms necessarily, 
Um, with the caveat that I'll say is remember that 15% of our courses were approved and I don't have documentation for the other 85%. What we did not do in any of this process is tell teachers, stop teaching, right? We did not ever say, stop teaching. What we're trying to do is if there are things that we've been teaching, this is what we've been doing for years, we're just trying to document and move that forward so we have those documents that are transparent, clear, and ultimately board approved. Um, but there are things being taught in our classrooms today that we don't have evidence of board approval because we don't have evidence of board approval and they've been taught for maybe 100 years. So that's just kind of where we are right now. Okay, so then the feedback that we have been gathering and so who we talked with, we talked with SILT, um, a curriculum instruction leadership team. We actually did a big gallery walk with charting what's working, what are areas for improvement. We met with teacher teams, especially our English department leads that are part of our district committee because they've been on the forefront of a lot of these conversations with novel approvals and other things that they've been innovative with. Um, we've talked with our teachers union, and we've also um, gathered themes from public comment from some of our board meetings, trying to represent just the broad theme. So it won't be every single comment that's ever been made, but the broad themes of feedback, that was just to say that was a confusing, tier two is confusing, okay, right? So we own that. Um, but what is working? So as we're talking with these groups, what's working about the new processes we started a year ago, October? Well, we have had materials approved. So we have had things working through the process and some clarity and transparency around approvals of new courses and instructional materials. We have a paper trail showing the process all the way from site to uh, site review and, and site school site council review to SILT and ultimately board approval. So in some sense, it's working. It's, it's there is a result of approval. Uh, teachers have indicated the site administrators have been very supportive, getting things on the school site council agendas, helping them navigate the process. Um, and some have identified that the current process doesn't give the committee's veto power. That is true. And so that, that's been something that's working. So let's say, um, I'll use a hypothetical. We have two schools that are international baccalaureate schools. And they have specific courses for IB. So theoretically, if a school, let's say XYZ school, high school, is not IB, and they don't like that course, their school site council could say no. And this course is still going to move through the process. What we would do is, if that were to happen, we haven't had that happen, but if that were to happen, we would document XYZ school is not in support of this. And that would be part of the information that comes forward to the next process. We would share that with SILT. We would share that with the board. But it's not like that school site council has veto power. It's, that's just part of the involvement input process. Ultimately, we'd like to know what are the concerns, address the concerns, and make sure that by the time it comes to the board, we have the full picture. And again, that was an extreme example. We haven't had school site councils vote things down, but if it were to happen, it wouldn't be a veto power. Um, there, what is working is providing the SILT agenda transparently. So we publish it to all staff, we send it to the committee, we try to send it at least a week in advance because there is a lot of information on there and we post it publicly on the website with the feedback surveys um, available. And then the focus and support for curricular leads is appreciated by those leads. So again, we have all subject areas now meeting on a frequent basis with support to be able to do these updates and not just picking a few subjects who have that access. That's a short list of what's working though. Okay, so what areas to improve? There are a lot. There are a lot of things we can do better as we seek to have transparency and have this full process. The clarification on those tiers is a big one. There was a, There is a lot of confusion. What's that tier two? How does that work? Is this the right thing? And um, we wanna have a clear process for everyone to understand and to identify the supplemental material, where does that fall and how is that approved? 
There's also question around what's a choice book, class-wide reading. So since a lot of the things that have come through so far are in the world of English language arts, novels have been a big part of that. And so some are choice where a student doesn't have to read it, it's not class-wide, but then in some classes it's, oh, we're all gonna read Romeo and Juliet, for example. So that's something that's still in question, especially with um, our parent community. Uh, it takes a lot of time to go through the process. And so that is just an area of awareness. Maybe there's an area to be improved, um, but the teachers have identified it's cumbersome to get something approved. They wanna be innovative. They wanna use things in the classroom. And that affects ultimately their ability to lesson plan. If let's say it's a new novel, if it's not yet approved, then they need to plan other things to do. Um, it feels less timely, and the teachers, um, one of the quotes that seemed to represent a, a portion of the comments was that they feel like they're not trusted, perhaps undermined in the process. It's, it's a little bit cumbersome. Um, we've also heard feedback that SILT doesn't feel open and honest. Um, we have teachers come in and present that aren't members of the committee, and in the past they've been asked to leave when we're going to have the vote. That didn't feel great. We've made some adjustments, um, but that was part of the feedback is like, we don't we feel like this awkward member, of, not member of SILT, what's our role? That doesn't feel great, um, and that was important for us to be aware of. And then another piece is we need a point person or a place to go to get all of the information. So is it school site council? Is it SILT? Is it the principal? Is it the district office ed services team? Who is it? And do we have the right level of approval? We have teachers that um, maybe have some anxiety around that because they wanna do the right thing. They wanna follow the rules, and, and, but it's not necessarily clear or um, transparent to them. And there's also this question on, is there an appeal process? So what if something isn't approved? Or if not that, maybe how do we get the right information out there um, to explain the why? Um, what we've had in the past, that list of 900 uh, textbooks I mentioned, that didn't really show the rationale of why do we want to teach this, this instructional material. Um, and so there's this wondering of how do we share that and get that across to the various uh, community members, parents, students, but also to yourselves as board members. Um, in addition, some of our public comments we've seen, um, parents don't necessarily feel like they're trusted partners in the process. So just as the teachers feel like they may be undermined and not trusted, parents don't feel maybe trusted or involved. Um, <clears throat> and there's this concept of is it a rubber stamp? If everybody just gives the thumbs up, if we don't have veto power, what is the purpose of bringing it to school site council or SILT? That is a, a critique that has been shared by some. Um, and then some parents and staff have shared, and, and we've heard at an open session, that maybe parents shouldn't be a part of the process, right? That just trust the teachers, you know, is one of the phrases we heard earlier tonight. Um, so these are just, these are some of the themes that we're trying to gather. Um, parent concerns regarding the committee member selection, who's on the committee, how did they get selected, why are they on it, why am I not on it, um, and then the last one that we had there was board member statements, um, previous board member statements in meetings that we might not be following education code. Um, so those have been some of the areas that have been uh, raised as potential concerns for us to consider and would love to continue the conversation with you um, at this point. And I know we have others that will be joining us in this conversation. So comments or questions? Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment about SILT as I've been attending since April. Um, and one thing that wasn't mentioned um, on this list, and it's an observation, and it's not um, to minimize this process at all, but um, very few people are actually reading the material that is being put through SILT. And it's understandable because it could be a huge manual, uh, or I'm sorry, not manual, but a um, textbook. And so the process seems to be a teacher giving an overview of why they chose it. And then everyone agrees and gives a thumbs up. The 900 books, or I wasn't there for the 900 books, but the, let's say, 165 books, no one's, unless they happen to read it on their own time, in a previous life, yes, I've read these few books, no one's reading it. Um, and so we should just make sure be aware of that is that it's a part of the approval process, but 
what, what are we doing to, to look at the material to make sure it's okay? So I just want to mention that. Any other questions now, or would you like to bring the teacher panel up in case we have questions that I they may answer? I just have a answer? comment. Is this on? Yeah, it's yeah. on. So um, I'm looking around the table here to find out who was here for the silt process when I went to my very first silt meeting, which was six or seven years ago. Yeah, I know. I was like, who can? So, um, and, and it, you know, it never matters when people say what happened before, but I'll just put a, I'll just put some reference on it. So when I went to my first SILT meeting six or seven years ago, the process was very, very different. And the observation I had recently of going to one, which I think was last year sometime, the process has changed significantly. There's a lot more involvement. There's a lot more intention put into what goes into the meeting. Is it perfect? No. Is there any process that's perfect? No. But what I think um, this new cabinet has inherited and what over the course of, of time, what we're seeing now compared to what we're seeing now is significantly better. Doesn't matter to anybody now at this sliver in time, but it matters to me because I was there and I saw it. And so I want to, I want to, lay that foundation because this is significantly better than what has been. And if you think there, if you think the process isn't perfect now, I will have to tell you that it is 10 times better than it's ever been. So. And what I didn't say is they actually discuss other things in that meeting. And I've witnessed some very positive communication and dialogue amongst all of the staff that come. But it's, it, but I'm, I was referring to the, the coursework so, but I agree. It's probably ten times better than what it was. Hundred, hundred. Okay, a hundred times better. And a lot more participation as well, and a lot more, a lot more participation, a lot more preparation that goes into it. And um, Ms. Layton has done a fantastic job in bringing that all together because I think she had a lot of work to get to the point she's at now. So, thank you for that. And just going again, going back, it's I think impossible to expect people to review a textbook in three days. I, so it wasn't, I, I, we just have to think about, we can't, no one's doing that. So does that need to be part is, are we doing the right thing by even putting it in the cell? That's all. And, and we'll talk more about where are the gaps and what we should be doing. But I think now would be the appropriate time to invite our panel down. So if you're one of our panelists, come on down. And uh, we have name tags for you, but I can't tell you where you sit because it's so small. First, I want to welcome all of you and thank you for taking the time to come tonight and share your perspectives with us. Um, our goal here, as I mentioned earlier, is to have each of you as a resource for the board to ask the questions um, for us to gain a better understanding. I mean, I think everyone can see when we were trying to arrange the boards, we don't really understand the process fully. Um, so that's the goal here tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce Jessica. All of you know Jessica Fork. She is going to introduce each of the teachers. Jessica is a teacher at Roseville High School and also the president of RSCA, the Teachers Bargaining Unit. So Jessica, why don't you introduce each of your panelists, their name and where they're from, and we'll go from there. Okay, I also want to say thank you for actually giving us this opportunity for me to bring this expert panel of teachers. We have somebody representing each school site. We have all seven schools represented here, and they are here to address your questions, so they're going to help you gather the information you need. And then we do agree that the process on curriculum materials should be transparent to all stakeholders, as well as clear, concise, and understandable. So I'm really hoping that these teachers will help you with that. Okay. So next to Kim, we're going to start there. Can I introduce myself? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Melanie Boisa. I'm the English department chair at Roseville High School. Um, I'm a third generation graduate from Roseville High School, class of 89. Uh, and um, my, both of my children graduated from Wood Creek High School, class of 2018 and class of 21. And then next to her, we have 
Hi, my name is Lisa Vaughn. I also am a graduate, 89, but Oakmont. Oh, hello, hello. We need to get the mic fixed there. Maybe try that mic there and see if that one's working. I can just talk louder. No, we, we've got the recording, so. It's been working. No. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm going to start over again. So, my name is Lisa Vaughn, and I also am a graduate of our district, 89, but rival, it was Oakmont. That's where I graduated from. Um, I am the department coordinator over mathematics at Granite Bay High School. I've been there since 1998. Um, I have gone through several curriculum movements within um, the mathematics world. Um, yeah, 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 they know. Um, I have also graduated a couple of my own children from this district, so I also have a perspective of being a parent, um, and I'm super excited to be here, and I hope, and I, I'm really excited to partner with everybody in here to have a process um, that makes sense and makes everyone happy. Hello, um, I'm Amy Marsh. I am an English teacher at Roseville High School. I'm also an uh, English co-chair, and I'm part of the English lead team for the district that has been working on um, course approvals and textbook approvals and supplemental approvals and all of those things. Um, I've been in the district for 16 years, um, and Hello, everyone. I'm Carolyn Hill. Um, I am a Spanish teacher in the World Language Department at West Park High School. I'm also part of SILT, and I'm also part of the West Park Site Council. And I am not a million years in the district. I um, moved from the Bay Area, but this is my second year in the district. And I also have children that will be graduates of the district. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christine Rossmiller. I'm a social science teacher at Oakmont High School. And I have also taught English at Oakmont High School. And I am the school's AP coordinator. Um, and this is my 19th year teaching in our district. And I also grew up in the Bay Area. Um, and so we came up here 19 years ago. And I've had the good fortune of working here the entire time. And I do have a son who's currently a sophomore in our district as well. So I echo the sentiment of my colleagues, and I really do hope that we can all work together to keep moving forward and make a progress that works for us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am Stacy Sanders. Um, I started at the district in 1999, and uh, I was first at Wood Creek for 22 years. In the last two years, I've been at uh, Roseville Pathways teaching th with the independent study program, the um, middle college program, and as well as the continuation program. I teach biology and chemistry currently, and I've also taught AP chemistry, integrated science, uh, food science, um, and all the other science classes. <laughs> I do have uh, three kids that I put through the district, and they were all Wood Creek grads. Um, I, I did have a COVID grad, so felt all your pain. Um, and um, looking forward to the process and clarifying all the stuff. Um, my name is Dana Duncan, and I am closing in on 30 years in education. I split my time between junior high. I was at Olympus in Eureka Union, and then I got the incredible opportunity to move over to Antelope, where I taught AP Psychology, AP U.S. History, CP U.S. History. Um, and now, currently, I'm serving as a teacher on special assignment as a professional learning specialist for literacy. Thank you. Did you have anything else, Jessica? Thank you very much. So, for my board colleagues, this is our opportunity to really reach in and learn about our actual practices in our schools and an opportunity for us to explore uh, any questions that you have, obviously only related to curriculum tonight, um, and hopefully this will be very informative for each of you. So if anyone has a question and would like to jump in, feel free. Otherwise, I've got a list of a few questions. Okay. 
All right, I'll, I'll start off. Um, so since each of you have been involved in our curriculum process, as you know, we're trying to get a true understanding of how we got to where we are and what we are actually doing. Can you help me understand how, I guess this would be particularly for the English teachers, perhaps, how do we ensure that the resources and the materials that we are asking our students to use in our courses are at an appropriate grade level of reading? So as we know, they have a number of different ways of assessing reading level, and we have books from pre-K that we read to kids to graduate level books. So how do you make that selection and how do you ensure that what you're selecting is appropriate for our students? That's my first question. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so in the Common Core framework, uh, there's an infographic where uh, the state of California has um, clarified that there are three aspects of complexity in consideration of any um, particularly extended text, but really any um, text of literary merit. Uh, there is the quantitative level, which is the lexile level. Um, that's a, a term or a measurement that uh, a lot of people have heard of. Um, and the lexile level, for, uh, for those of you who are not English teachers, um, is derived from snapshots of 125 words of the text. So they take multiple snapshots of 125 words, and then they measure the length of the sentences in that snapshot, and then they look at both the complexity of the vocabulary and the number of instances that that vocabulary exists. Um, those three variables determine the lexile level. Um, what is not included in that quantitative measurement is the actual length of the text or anything that the text actually says. Um, so in the qualitative component, which is the second third of this triangulation, has to do with the level of um, complexity of meaning. This is the qualitative part. So this is uh, the meaning in the text, like what it's about, uh, the purpose of the text, the structure, the complexity, the nuance, the relationship to the text, like all of that stuff that happens um, in literature that is different um, are unique or special in uh, literature as opposed to like a mathematics textbook. Uh, and then finally, the reader and the task. So what does the reader bring to uh, the reading of the text? This would be background knowledge or cultural knowledge or experience, um, even generation, uh, generational knowledge, that kind of stuff, life experience, and then also how is it related to the task at hand? And so uh, one of the things that I think is important when we're talking about reader and task is that uh, in the English department, we don't teach, like we don't teach to kill a mockingbird. That's not, um, that's not the, the, the skill or the knowledge set that we're aiming for kids to achieve. What we're hoping that, or what, our goal is, is that kids learn about complex plot structures or the development of a theme or the interaction of multiple complex themes as they go up through Common Core. So the relationship of the text to the task, like how does it relate to theme or how does it relate to plot, is the third, uh, the third part of that triangulation. Um, and so, uh, in looking at that, um, the next piece that we need to understand is that literature, by its very nature, tends to score lower on lexile levels than, um, than nonfiction texts or instructional materials. So, um, I was looking at a, um, a textbook from a fourth level um, music theory course in a university. Um, I also looked at our economics book uh, from our, one of our math teachers um, and, um, and a science textbook. And what is interesting about those books for the Lexile level is that 
always sentence structures are longer in informational material, just by the nature of informational material. But also, the language is specialized to that particular um, discipline. And it often comes with other ancillary information that allows the reader to understand it. So in the music theory book, there were a level, there were a number of staffs, and it showed a whole bunch of different I don't know, things that I don't know because I'm not a music major. Um, <clears throat> but all of that visual information supported the sentence length and the vocabulary complexity. So while the number from a strict lexile level looked really high, like 1385 or something like that, all of the visual material brought that down. The other um, variable of that is that when you're reading a music theory four textbook, you've already gone through music theory one, two, and three. And so the students that are reading that book come with a set of knowledge that allows them to understand that text complexity at a higher level than um, a, a, um, an English a, a novel that could be about any subject under the sun. Uh, so that's another kind of variable that we deal with when we deal with text complexity, is that our kids aren't reading a series of novels that are all on the same topic or the same discipline. So there's that varied um, content that allows them to be um, modern thinkers and good workers and critical thinkers and all of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. So, um, so that's um, that's where I. Oh, so um, so there's a little bit of um, miscommunication, I think, when we're talking about lexile levels, because, uh, for instance, um, Alexander in the No Good, Very Good, Bad Day book um, that all of our children have read has a lexile level of about 950. Uh, because the sentence structures are long and because vocabulary isn't repeated. Uh, Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series in Lexile level also runs between about 870 and 980, 1,000, somewhere in there. So right in the same Lexile level. So if you take the sentences from Alexander, you take the sentences from Harry Potter, in 125 word snippets, they're going to read exactly the same. Where this becomes even more interesting is that uh, Ernest Hemingway's style is deceptively simple, but his themes are deceptively complex. And um, Old Man and the Sea also has a lexile level of 940. And so when we look at those three books, um, all very different, I think we all agree that they have different grade level um, appropriateness but the lexile level is just one part of that discussion. So when we're looking at books, we certainly take lexile level into consideration, but that's one third of the, convert, of the consideration that then also has to apply to the qualitative measurement of the book, how, um, how appropriate is the meaning, purpose, structure, and complexity of the, of the meaning of the text, for the students in our class, and also how well does the text relate to the actual standard that we're teaching. Um, one thing I'd also like to add to that when we're looking at text selections is knowing the students in our room. Um, in a room, you know, classroom for right now, for example, my second period has 39 students in it. So those 39 students all come to me with different varying levels of skill. Um, and so when I'm looking at a text, I'm looking for all of the things that Melanie stated, but I'm also looking to see what text can I use that is going to allow my higher end reading students to push themselves, but still allow an entrance level for some of my students who struggle. So if I'm reading a text that is for all 39 students, I'm going to need to make sure that I'm addressing the skills and standards for all 39 of those students but they are all coming to me with different levels. So selecting text that allows me to meet the needs of all of those students to make sure they're getting their, um, working on those skills and standards and meeting those skills and standards is also an important factor as well. Okay, if I could add just one more thing to that. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the other, um, 
misunderstandings about tech selection in individual classrooms is that we have carte blanche to um, to actually choose techs, and uh, we don't. Uh, we don't have funding to just go out and buy new books. We have 36 kids per class, and we have three classes, so we're in you know the 120s of of titles, and so we don't just as an English teacher, even as the department chair, I don't say, we're just going to pick this book and we're all going to read it. Like that doesn't, um, that doesn't happen from a financial standpoint. We don't have that kind of capacity. And so um, in my 27 years in the English department, we have always read the books that were available to us in the library. So that's not, um, just to clarify, like how we choose supplemental texts. Well, we don't, um, we don't get that opportunity a whole bunch. That uh, it is relevant, but it is not representative of how we use textbooks in our class. Thank you. That was very helpful. I have a couple of sort of follow-ups. <clears throat> yep. Go ahead. Well, are you following yeah. up on what they just said? Yeah, following up on this topic. Okay. But well, go ahead. Okay. So, what I'm hearing is reading level, or the decile. What was it? Lexile. Okay, does not always indicate age level or grade level. So how do we ensure, two questions here, the age appropriateness and then the subject matter appropriateness. As you know, we've, we receive a lot of emails. We had a comment tonight about objectionable material or controversial material. If you could touch on those two issues of determining that age, grade level appropriateness, which I think you inferred quite a bit in that previous, but if you can go a little further, and then objectionable, questionable, however you want to define that. Uh, so <laughs> okay, now is it on? Okay, so um, again, the objectionable m material is um, is is an interesting discussion point because because historically we don't have a lot of choice in books. I will say what is objectionable um, to some might not be objectionable to others. And if we, sorry. Uh, so that is, I mean, that, I think that's a discussion. I think that's part of the reason why having parent input is good. Certainly over and over again, the, the staff that I've worked with, the lead team, um, we have been very open with our parents who have had questions about texts, and we've given them alternate um, alternate titles. Um, I, I teach AP language, which has college level work, and uh, we read a textbook, and a parent didn't want her kid to read it, so we gave her another book, and she was perfectly happy, and all was well, because we were talking about rhetoric and how an author uses language. We weren't talking about the specific content of that book, so. Um, I think that's that's part of it. Um, um, so, and the age appropriate level component, I think there are a lot of different lists that we have referenced in the past. Common Core does have a list of exemplar texts available to us, and certainly most of our titles are in those. What is interesting in relationship to the Lexile level is at the 910 level, the list of exemplars, I think there are 13 of them, and 11 of them don't meet the Lexile band for 910 in Common Core. And at the 1112 level, I think there are 14, uh, there are 15 books on that exemplar list for appropriate material, and 11 of them fall underneath the below the Lexile band recommended by Common Core. So again, it's that triangulation of quantity, quality, and meeting the needs of task. So the quality portion, is there a, a Lexile equivalent for the quality? Or, I, or is that just subject, you know, you read it? Yeah, so the, uh, the document that Melanie is referring to that there's a, it's like a tree, three, the three different things. The, um, the other measurement is really based on human experience with the text. Um, so because again, it's looking at multiple meanings and it's looking at deeper levels. It's, you know, like allegory stuff. That's not something that technology can necessarily pick up like a human can. Um, so there are a lot of different resources that we use to, to get ideas about new texts. 
the Common Core um, list, the CDE has lists, um, AP approved lists, Kate, which is the California Association of Teachers of English has lists. Um, so most of our recommendations or if we're looking for something to bring into our course to meet the needs of our current students, those are usually the places we go to um, because they've been tried and true with other educators and their experience with, with students. Yeah. And the, um, the excerpt that was read in open comment was a little shocking to me and I did a quick little zap out to my English teacher friends and none of us know what the title is of that book. Um, I was curious so, also what the title was. Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, none of us knew that, uh, so there you go. Um, so, um, so in the bluest eye, um, I'm sure. That, so, um, I'm sure that there is some um, some context within there that would certainly be um, could be viewed as objectionable. And you know that if a parent didn't want the student to read the rest of the book that wasn't that um, that chunk, then certainly we would just choose a different book for them. Um, <clears throat> but I think it also stands. Um, it we need to bear witness to time also because. Uh, you know, like if we read Shakespeare, if we read Romeo and Juliet, it's it's fraught with rape language. You know, there um, there are uh, Macbeth, certainly Hamlet, lots of violence. So anywhere in Shakespeare and in traditional texts, going back, we can see examples of um, of potentially objectionable material. And I all do respect if um, if a parent finds something objectionable, then their student shouldn't read it. I, no doubt about it, uh, and we can certainly um, we can certainly change the text so that they have one that's that's reasonable for them. I'm assuming you've read all the books that you suggest. Uh, that yeah, I, well, I read the Bluest Eye in like the eighth grade, okay. so and I'm fifty two. <laughs> Do you give a heads up if if uh, you must know you would must know if there's potential objectionable material. So I, to speaking for the site at Roseville High School where I'm from, um, all of our English teachers discuss and provide lists about texts at back to school night um, and in our syllabi so that parents can see what it is their students will be reading throughout the semester um, and then have those conversations. Hopefully if there's something that they do find that they're not comfortable with to have those conversations about you know, well, how do I actually use this book, right? Because like Melanie was saying, we don't teach books. We use books as a vehicle for teaching skills and standards. So having those conversations about the context of how we use the book, because um, sometimes there are uh, controversial topics that we read about in that standing on its own is like, wow, you're really pushing some sort of idea here. But then in context, well, we look at that one, but we also look at another text that gives the exact opposite viewpoint, right? And how we're looking at that in the language and stuff. That's just a little example. But having those conversations with our parents and, and making sure that they do come to us and say, you know, I'm not quite sure about this. I read it. I, and I think that that's probably the most powerful thing. And we always provide that information at the beginning of the semester so that if there is a conversation that comes up, we can kind of head it off ahead of time and come together to a consensus about like, okay, well, what is something else that we can put in place for your student if that's not something you're comfortable with? And we can have those conversations. So I know at Roseville High School, that's what we do. Um, and I think it's pretty standard across the district, but I can only speak for Roseville High School on that one. And then you also mentioned that, Amy, I think, I think it was Amy, right? I'm sorry. It's such tiny writing over there. Um, that you look at your class of 30, at nine, and wide range of ability, and, and unfortunately, okay, Unfortunately, parents are just given Lexile numbers, right? Because that's the only quantitative number we're ever given to assess how well our children are reading, um, for the most part. And and so you have to pick a book that's going to work for everybody. Do you find that typically the Lexile number is lower? Because you mentioned that um, that for the reviewing these lists, and you have ninth and tenth grade and let's say half of them are actually below reading level for Lexile, or sorry, below grade level for Lexile. And, and I'll admit, at one point, I was looking at my own books that I really enjoyed, and I would shot, oh, that was sixth grade level, and I, would, and I feel a little bit, 
um, silly that I just read a sixth grade level book, but I really enjoyed it. So I, so I appreciate that sometimes the Lexile number isn't what you can go off of, but are you finding that you're just choosing lower numbers because you have to, to I, accommodate everybody? I don't think so. I think okay. that, um, so, and to, to maybe make you feel a little better, the 2021 20, Pulitzer Prize winning book was at a Lexile level of 900. So, which is about four fifth grade level and it right. won a Pulitzer Prize, right? So great literature doesn't necessarily have to be high Lexile. Um, and I think in our situation here in the district, what our English lead team and our English department really strives for is not to lower the standard of the text, but really use innovative teaching strategies to help with the skills and knowledge to bring kids up. Because again, we're not teaching the text itself. We're teaching skills and standards through the vehicle of the text. So um, naturally, a lot of literature is in that kind of, like you said, middle range, some of your favorite books. Um, conversationally, we speak at about a third to fifth grade reading level in just everyday conversations, what we watch on TV, um, all of those speaking is about a third to fifth grade reading level. So, and like Melanie was saying, literature is very different than a biology college textbook, which is going to have a very high Lexile level for all the reasons she explained. So our Lexile levels, it's not that we are trying to meet a book that's going to be less difficult in its complexity. We want books that are in some ways more complex because they allow for these different levels of analysis, right? So a book that has a lot of complexity is going to allow for a student to take information and look at themes and get really creative with their thinking in terms of what those might be. But it's also going to be accessible to a student who isn't quite there yet. And they might be looking at some more generalized themes, right? So again, that the books that we're choosing aren't, we're not bringing them down to meet the needs of all of our students. Um, they're actually have more entryways to access them. But then how do you, how do you bring the, the student up if you're always choosing, right. so, I, I hate to always switch no, on Lexile, okay. but, but then so, how, but how do you improve the vocabulary and so the So that would be through our actual teaching strategies and the teaching practices that we implement in the classroom with the tool of the book. So um, we call it differentiated instruction. So depending on the levels of our students, um, we're going to provide strategies and activities that's going to allow students of different levels to access the content of the book in order to do the skills and thinking that they're gonna need. So um, also, uh, I think that's a really valid question. And um, I think what's really important to remember is that reading by discipline um, a needs to also occur by discipline. And so again, like if we go back to the, the economics textbook that had a 1385 Lexile level, that some of the responsibility of being able to read at a 1380 Lexile level in economics, um, some of that responsibility falls on the economics teacher to teach the vocabulary needed in order to manage that 1385. Um, we can't, as language teachers, can't teach the vocabulary needed for music theory and economics and um, physics. You know, like we, that's not, that's not um, in our, in our, in our wheelhouse. And so um, what we can do is we can help kids to learn how to read critically and how to understand nuance and look at uh, figurative language and multiple meanings of words and all of those things that would not necessarily be uh, represented in a Lexile level. Um, I love the example of the great Gatsby because Gatsby is written at a seventh grade level. Um, however, first, I wouldn't have a seventh grader read it. Um, I just wouldn't. Gatsby is a deplorable human being. Um, but um, then I read it my junior year of high school as a, someone who I knew I was going to be an English major. I read 
all the time. And I read Gatsby as a junior at Roseville High School. Um, and I didn't get it. I hated it. I was like, this is the dumbest book I've ever read. And then I came back to it as an adult. And I said, oh, my goodness. Look at this book. Look at Look at all of the nuance. Look at the commentary about human frailty. Look at the duality of within and without. Look at the American dream and what has come of the American dream and how to get to the American dream. And as a 30-year-old, that book had so much more meaning to me than it did as a 16-year-old, and certainly it wouldn't have had no meaning to me as a, as a seventh grader. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in a minute just on process. <clears throat> we have about an hour's worth of public comment. So we are going to spend 15 more minutes on question and answer. Now, we can also count books by word count. So we're gonna think about our answers to these questions in word count, shorten them down a little bit. <laughs> so, do you have any other questions? Well, let me ask, what, are the, what do you see of the pros and cons of parent involvement? Because that seems to be a big hot button, is hot button issue right now. love to have a conversation with any parents about any book uh, anything you know all press is good press any reading is good reading so let's get at it let's go have coffee and talk about books i you know um julie and i once had a conversation about the devil in white city um which is a book that we read in ap language um and the content of that I think that uh, the more we read, the higher students' lexile success will be. Um, and so let's read more. Let's have coffee. <laughs> I, I'm going to open a can of worms, but we're, we have only a few a few words we can use here. But I, I just want to bring up some things. So we were talking, the word objectionable was used before and subjective came up to mind. And I've had some conversations with all kinds of parents about this, about the content, supplemental reading list, et cetera. And I think about our demographics of our kids and families. We have all walks of life, different socioeconomic levels, religions, levels of education, what's appropriate, what's not 89 languages, or probably more, how many languages do we have? 89? I don't know, it's a lot. And kids from ages 13 to 18 or so. And so I think about the definition of what's appropriate, and I think that's where a lot of the conversation lies, is whose definition of appropriate is the right definition, and I don't think there is one. Um, and so, I don't have the answer to that, and I don't think we can have the answer to that with, with just the wide variety that um, I mentioned there, plus so much more. So I think, for me, it's about coming to more common definition, or I don't know if that's even the right way to put it, but I just put it out there because I think that's what keeps coming up, because it's it, where, where we get in conflict is our personal definition. And I, Heidi and I were talking about a book a couple of months ago, and it was something that Dr. Moore brought to us. And we had very different um, perspectives on whether that book is appropriate or not. And because we're two different women, two different parents, two different life experiences. And so <clears throat> that's just a comment I'm making right now, because I think that's the heart of a lot of it. And I don't know how you get to the bottom of it, but it's... Um, that's where I see a lot of the conflict coming is our, our personal definitions are getting in the way. So that's what I think. So, that's what I think, not what I know, but. Any other questions? I want to give the student board members an opportunity. Do you have any questions related to the curriculum? Okay. Any other questions up here? Can I just comment on what, what Julie just yes. said? Okay. I think what, what sometimes gets missed in these beautiful placards is the level of conversation that's happening in the background at sites. And it's not like every teacher has the same opinion or the same perspective either. And so there's a lot of talk about how to standardize selections using data, using CASP data. Look, uh, Amy talked about looking at the kids in front of her, but then site leads look at the district in front of us also and look at access and look at um, how can we reach as many kids as effectively as possible. And in those conversations, the teachers in the room and, and any parent who wants to involve in that too, as Melanie's offering coffee, um, <laughs> um, we talk about balance. 
we talk about counter and counterpoints and, and argument and debate and um, balance is a standardized piece that we look at when we're choosing um, any selections really, but definitely core selections. We've standardized, I think, as much of the process as we possibly can. And what's between the placards is an incredible amount of rich, rich, difficult conversation at any content level. Too. Just to zoom out from English, social science, we've had our share of, of those difficult conversations too. So you're right, I agree with you. The meaning of appropriate is hard to, it's hard to measure one way. I, if I could just say one more thing, sorry, I'm the big word person. Um, I would also say that um, it's important to consider the something that is objectionable and whether it's being um, uh, discussed or if it's being promoted. And I, I think that's, a, I, I, I'm always like really surprised by that when it comes up in conversation a million years ago, we had lots of conversations about Huck Finn and the use of the N-word. Um, <clears throat> and um, the, the book does not advocate uh, racism. It exposes racism and the ugliness of it and the limiting of humanity of people as Mark Twain saw it um, and because it's it's satire. And so um, is the, the N word is incredibly objectionable to me. It is unsavory. I don't let my children use it. I, it is not allowed in my house. I don't like music that uses that word. Ex it, although, the book, uh, the book Huck Finn is particularly enlightening about all of those aspects of racism as Mark Twain saw it. And so the book makes perfect sense for my children to read. And so I just wanted to clarify that, um, that even, even Toni Morrison or um, Maya Angelou or some of those people um, who wrote about really horrific events in their lives, they weren't advocating for that or we were not teaching kids those things. Um, what we're doing is allowing them to see these life experiences of these people and, and how they overcome trauma or how they, they humanize their, their experiences. Um, it's all of that stuff. So I just wanted to clarify the difference between promoting and acknowledging that some of those unsavory elements do exist. Can Thank I, you. Oh, sorry, can I ask this? Let me do one thing and then we'll squeeze in another question. I know several of you didn't get an opportunity to talk, and I'm not blaming the others who did talk, um, <laughs> but there may have been questions that we didn't ask so we have just a couple of minutes before we get to public comment so if there's a question that you think we failed to ask you that's important that we get the answer to we've got just a couple of minutes for you to pipe in now we'll have other opportunities in the future because like i said this is the beginning of a conversation not the end of a conversation so if you haven't spoken yet and you have some burning answer to a question we haven't asked i want to give you that opportunity then i'll let marla ask her last question and then we're going to get to our public comment I, I can follow up on, I wanted to follow up on something Julie said. First of all, I, I do tend to agree. I think that we're talking about the difference in, uh, in a subjective term in terms of when you say what's appropriate. And I do very much believe that there's a lot of different factors that go into a complexity and appropriateness of a text. And I do think that it will take a continued extended conversations um, and definitely including parent voices in that. Um, and then I just wanted to emphasize kind of building off of what Dana said as well, that it's a really laborious process. Um, it, I think on one of those slides, uh, Dr. Moore mentioned that it took a lot of time. It's not just time though, because we are talking about our, you know, our beliefs and our values and all of that. So it takes a lot of emotional commitment, a lot of intellectual commitment, a lot of civil and civic discourse, and all of that on top of, of what we're doing already. So um, as Dr. Moore pointed out, we have a process that we've kind of started to use here for more recently. Um, and so that is a, a humongous commitment 
on the part of everybody that's participating. And I think that we need to be really, that's part of the transparency, is the tr a tremendous amount of work. Um, aside from the English department, we are going through some other um, textbook adoption processes. And to Marla's point earlier, there are actually, I'm one of them, I'm sitting there plowing through a very high Lexile level government textbook to consider it, and I am reading every page. Now, it doesn't mean I'm gonna agree with every single page, but I have to look at it in its totality, and I do have to read all of that, and that has to be above and beyond, and then I really want to have that opportunity to engage in discourse with my colleagues, with our content area leads, with our community, because I think it's really important the more conversation like this we have, the more we have a shared understanding. And we don't all agree, but we have a shared understanding of what this is involving and what it takes to do it well. And then we at least can agree that you know we've done our very best because honestly, that's what the students of this district deserve. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, in the math world, we have just brought in I am one and I am two, and the process started uh, four superintendents ago. It has taken mountains being moved to get to where we are now. The process starts with, in the math world, what do we want our students to look like, sound like, and act like um, when they graduate? What do we want to see as mathematicians when they leave our high school? Similarly, since I'm sitting between, <laughs> um, to, to English, um, every single piece of content that's available in, say, an IM1 or an IM2 and IM3, we can't cover everything, but I could still encourage and teach and move students along in that inner mathematician by picking certain content. And as a district team, we work towards that. We say, what, what are the specific pieces that we're going to use to build those mathematicians? What I, wanted, what I want you to hear is it is very intentional. It is very reflective. Um, it, it is very thorough, it's very invigorating, it's, it's, um, it, it makes me excited about doing new things. Although I'm gonna be honest, if you come back at math in three years and say we gotta revisit something, like we're gonna have, we're gonna have a problem. Like I really think you gotta go like 10 years before you talk to math again, um, in, in any case. Um, but listening to Dr. Moore talk about the process what made me a little bit nervous, and I was talking to Stacy about this, and it really got me thinking, this, um, the possibility of an oversight, a board oversight on every little thing we do. So, for example, in the math world, I go to Teachers Pay Teachers to find exciting stuff. We go to Desmos, we bring in activities. Um, I try to, I actually Google exciting math activities. There's not a lot on the internet that's called exciting math activities. But I, we try. Um, I am working with my PLT constantly in saying, you know, what can we do to make this more exciting? Is there something else that we can, we can use? And I have always felt as the professional that I was able to bring that in. What makes me a little bit nervous in seeing the, that, that slide and hearing what you guys are saying is, is a over, and I do not want to minimalize what's happening right now in the English world. That is a discussion and I am so excited for English teachers and parents and our district to have that discussion, discussion in order to reach a resolution. But what I'm really nervous about is that's gonna be the platform to which you approach everything in our district in terms of curriculum. And I really want you to remember that there's a lot of, um, we, are prof we are the professionals that are able to say, I know what's exciting for my students. Gosh, if I'm sitting there bored with this example and I'm the math teacher, like something's gotta give on this. What can we do? So I just wanna encourage you as a board to be thinking um, about the precedent that you could be setting. 
And actually, Lisa, that was actually my question is, I was wondering how much just-in-time material do you, and I'm calling it just-in-time, so how much just-in-time material do you use a on lot. a monthly, weekly, I don't know? Daily. Daily. Like, I, right before this meeting, I found the activity online, printed it, and it's ready to go for tomorrow. Um, even after teaching for 24 years. So we're constantly looking for the new thing. We're constantly looking for that shiny thing that's going to engage one more kid, bring one more kid into the loop. Um, hopefully it's all of them. That's always the goal. Um, but even if it's just one more kid that you can string along, yes, please. So with the, and just a little background on science, um, we transitioned, we were one of the first districts to transition to the NGSS. And at that time, when we pulled the trigger on the transition, there were no NGSS approved textbooks available to buy. So we went out and we found our materials, or we created ourselves our materials to use in our science classes. And we've been using those, I think, pretty successfully for the past a lot of years um, since the NGSS came about. Um, so when we, in my mind, when we're talking about supplementary materials, I I wonder what a non-supplementary material looks like. Uh, I've written most of the stuff that I use myself in my class. So I just, uh, I mean, I don't want you guys to have to take my chemistry class to <laughs> approve it. <laughs> um, I don't think that that would be a good use of your time. So, so what would you all suggest? Let's, let's hold off on that part. Because right. this is really, we should be exploring what we are doing, not what we think we should be doing yet. So I really want to keep it focused on that. So we also hit my time mark for where I wanted to get into public comment. So here's what we're going to do for public comment. We have a lot of people who want to speak. We have, I know, because I know many of you, we have opinions that are vastly different on this subject. I'm going to ask all of you to be respectful of people's comments. We don't need cheers and we don't need jeers. We just need your comments so that we can understand your perspectives and your viewpoints. If for no other reason, every time you clap or boo, it's gonna take us longer to get through this. So uh, be respectful. Let us know what you want us to know from your opinion. And keep in mind our goal here today is examining what the framework is we must work in the policies we've set and what our practices are, and we're looking for where we can make improvements or if we need to change. So I would like the comments to hopefully be focused on that so that we have the ability to meet our objective of giving some broad direction on what we would like to see options for in the future. When we have that, you will all have opportunity to give input on those specific changes if there will be any changes. April, did you want to say something? I see that mic going up. Yes, I was just wondering if we could release our teachers. I know they have lesson plans that they're preparing, and um, they were not planning to stay up here for public comment, if that's OK. Yeah, but I have a comment before they leave. OK, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to um, pick up on what Ms. Vaughn was saying about you know getting involved at every level. And I just want to mention that we get held accountable for every, well, not for everything that happens. And so and I, I don't think any of us have a problem with being held accountable, but I think it's just very important to remember that, right? And so just like your your children, when they go and um, crash your car into the neighbor's car, <laughs> you get held accountable for that. And so um, not to say that any teacher's intent would be to do that, but so I think what's important to understand is being held accountable as a trustee is really um, a job I take seriously. And, um, and so w that requires a lot of trust, right? And so part of the process here today is um, really building, rebuilding that trust and continuing to build that trust. So, but thank you for that. Thank you. And I will just add, as I stated earlier, our goal is to make sure that we're meeting our obligation and duties per the Ed Code and that we're providing an environment so that our students get the best education. That's our goal. And I think we'll get there. Um, 
It's just going to take a little bit more process. So you are free. You are dismissed, class. You are free to go do what you need to do. Um, for the public speakers, I made sure to keep these in the order they were submitted. So those who submitted earlier get to speak earlier. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you to all our teachers. So what I want to do is there's a long distance between where you're sitting and the microphone. So I'm going to read off three names. When I read those three names, I want the first person to speak and the other two people to come down and be ready to speak so we have a quick transition. I want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to speak. You'll have 90 seconds to speak um, and give the board your comments. So the order... Do we want to take a short break? Oh, Let, let's take a three minute break, not five. Three minute break, if you need to use the restroom, get something to drink, don't go far, because when we come back, I'm going through this list and you don't want to miss your name being called. Three minutes.
So it's been more than three minutes, so find your seats and we'll get started here very shortly. Okay, thank you everyone. We're going to get this meeting going again. Uh, just a reminder, we have 90 seconds. Um, the clock's behind me, so I can't see it, so make sure you're watching it. Uh, we're going to go in the order received, and please, respectful, we don't need to cheer or jeer. We want to make sure everyone gets their opportunity to speak. And once I call your name, come down so you're ready to speak, so we don't have a lot of transition time. We're going to start off with Natalie Robbins. Catherine Sinceri and Shemaine Phillips in that order. Hey, good evening. Thank you so much. I'm Natalie Robbins. I am um, a teacher at uh, Roosevelt Pathways and also the president elect for the RSCA coming up. Um, the last board meeting I sat through is um, a question asked one of the candidates is how can you make sure that your opposed opinion is heard? And that question really resonated with me, and I was thinking that's a really great question. And I was thinking that when I'm working in my class with my students, we're always wanting to give them ideas that have voice. And I was like, how can we? Well, then I went back to what, like, what, what, what I was grown up with. My mom always said, um, actions speak louder than words. And I thought like, this would be a perfect opportunity. So we want to make sure that we are aware that our teachers showed up for today to speak up. And that is, that's all of us don't have time to speak. I want to let them know that we are here. This is a very passionate statement or a position that we are um, very much focused on. And we know that this is a very monumental task that we really represent. And I just want to ask and beg that you do not forget us and that we are wanting to help in this process. And we're all about it with this, um, this growing, high achieving district that you would um, consider us and that we can build and be part of it at the beginning, the middle, and the end so we can keep maintaining that achievement that we have and to continue and redefine the trust that we need in our district between all the stakeholders. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Catherine Sanceri, followed by Shemaine Phillips, followed by Christina Munoz. And don't feel like you have to use all 90 seconds. <laughs> all right, thank you. She don't so have first to. of all, so I'm Catherine Sanceri. I'm a social science teacher at Oakmont. I actually want to start off by thanking Marla. I sent a letter to the board on this subject, and Marla sent me a very thoughtful and measured response, which I really appreciated. So thank you for taking the time to hear me. Um, I just want to speak as a social science teacher. Our use of supplemental materials is a little bit different from English. We typically don't do novel studies in social science. A lot of times we use short excerpts of longer texts, multiple different sources. So in one class period, I might have students compare four different articles on a similar topic and compare their perspectives. That's four supplemental materials I now need to put on the list. Um, I'm part of the Ethnic Studies District team. We spent five pullout days compiling all of our supplemental materials, hundreds of them, and I just, it doesn't seem from like a cost or a time standpoint, think of all the subs we had to pay for that, this just seems like a grueling process, and I don't know if it's providing any additional benefit. Um, I agree on the need to be transparent, but spent having five teachers spend five days compiling every two-minute video clip we watch in class, every paragraph excerpt of a text that we read um, just seems really inefficient. And then the emotional energy we expend when our texts are rejected and we don't really understand why or what was wrong about them, and there's no opportunity for us to appeal that is really challenging as well. So thank you again for your time. Next, we have Shemaine, followed by Christina Munoz, followed by Karen Combest. Hello again. There are so many things I want to say about what I just witnessed, but I'm going to go ahead and stick to my script. Um, there's dozens of ed code policy and book examples I'd like to tie into clear board uh, policy violations and ed code violations tonight, but there's not enough time, so let me recap. Ed code 60400, teachers are using materials without board approval, clear violation. Ed code 60041, books like American Born Chinese, I'm Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, and Perks of Being a Wallflower directly promote the use of tobacco, drugs, alcohol, among other things, which I won't mention right now, and violate this. 
Ed Code 60045, books like The Bluest Eye, The 57 Bus, and Persepolis do not align with this code and are not suited to the needs of high schoolers. They are reading levels of second through fifth grade, are sexually explicit, and do not achieve the district's vision of college and career readiness. Board Policy AR 6141, ask yourselves, are explicit materials promoting the use of tobaccos, drugs, incest, alcohol, sex, abortion, rape, suicide, assault, pedophilia, really teaching and achieving the district vision of college and career readiness? If so, prove it with research. <clears throat> and by the way, are those really appropriate? Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of things that we're gonna ask for for better policy and process, which I will um, do separately. But one thing that I think is very clear is all instructional materials, it needs to be ensured that um, they are provided to parents prior to use with book theme, Lexile level, and parent approved with sign off. Your, your time is up, I'm sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Keep in mind, if you don't get all your time, you can send us an email. Remember, no, no cheers or jeers. Christina, then Karen, and then Carrie, Ocknar? Kochnar? There should be a step stool for us that are vertically challenged. That's just. The district's vision states the goal is preparing students to be college and career ready. Recently, we, had, we have seen blurred lines over what this means. This has resulted in teaching political literacy rather than developing skills of reading, writing, problem solving, and comprehension. The district approved English books with an average lexile level of third to fifth grade reading level for ninth to 12th graders. While not all kids will attend college, understanding complex documents will be critical to success. The actions of teachers who are instructing with low level reading materials are not promoting high levels of students' achievement. This is the result of no proper process or structure and flawed policy. Site Council and SILT are the first two steps for curriculum approval and review. I can tell you from participating in both, the processes are ineffective. Parents' involvement shouldn't be measured by up to 12 parents when there are 10,576 students in the district. This is less than 0.2%. The last step is the board, who under the law has the final say in what gets approved, elected by the parents and community to ensure proper education for our students. A broken curriculum process has allowed sexually explicit books, a list of 900 supplemental materials, and low-level literacy reading into the classrooms. How is the board going to change the books that are currently available and prevent this from happening in the future? As our elected officials, we expect this of you. In closing, I'm proposing regular communication. You know, like what happens with weekly school updates? That's not happening for curriculum. And parents approve for all books inside the classroom and libraries, as well as alternative options. Your time is up, thank you. Karen, and then Carrie, and then... Yvette, maybe? If, if there's an Yvette, that's you. If it's not, then I'll figure out the name. Hi there, good evening. My name is Karen Combest, and I'm a parent um, of a student, a senior at Oakmont High School, and I have a 2020 grad, so I've been in the school district seven years, so I have a lot of experience. I've also participated in SILT, and I would say as a from a parent perspective um, and the engagement level, uh, it, it's hard. Um, it, we don't really feel welcome. I mean, I was in the, the last silt where two parents put their thumbs down and we were ignored. And a teacher, in response to Marla Franz's question about not preparing, she said, why should we prepare? It's our teacher peers. We don't need to prepare. We're, we trust them. We're going to go with whatever they said. So with that in mind, I, I, I read a, an excerpt from that Bluest Eye book to my daughter, a senior, a 17-year-old. We talk about a lot. Um, here we go. Removing himself from her was so painful to him that he cut it short and snatched his genitals out of the dry harbor of her vagina. So when the child regained consciousness, she was lying on the kitchen floor under a heavy quilt, blah, blah, blah. My daughter said, oh my God, mom, that's gross. And I said, well, that's a book that's in the approved curriculum. And she said, well, what if that girl had been raped or sexually molested by her father? What would she be feeling if she read that? So I'm just going to pass that along because I think we, um, we miss the impacts that some of this material, I think we can all agree on what's not appropriate, and Shemaine listed that list. I know it's hard to uh, you know, find the list of what is appropriate, but what's not appropriate is pretty simple. I'd like the district to focus on what you're supposed to do, academics, and I'd like the board to represent your con constituents, please. Thank you. Carrie, Yvette, and then Mel Melissa Getzow. 
a senior at West Park High School and an incoming freshman. I'm um, gonna try to keep this super short. I've been in education for 20 years. And I think that my main concern right now is that we shouldn't be allowing any content of explicit topics. Um, we need to shield our kids and we need to give them plenty of access of content with virtue, morality, grit, positivity, and hope. Um, what I'm hoping that we can start factoring into decisions uh, moving forward is that our teens are being bombarded with messages from authors, movie producers, random kids trending on social media and their peers. It's affecting them every single day. And as parents, we spend hours decompressing all of these topics with our children each night. Um, books with these messages that are expressed in a lewd or detailed graphic nature, they really aren't necessary in order to achieve our standards and goals in the classroom. It's really not necessary to expose them to that trauma and there's so many other literature options that can be chosen instead. These many heavy topics are dark and without proper mental and emotional maturity in a support system at home. These thoughts in the minds of our teens, they're just not equipped to deal with it. And just this morning, I got a phone call from a parent who my daughter had noticed she had started cutting and reached out to her mom. And it was from things that she had been reading, things that she had been watching, things that were trending. Here she never had these ideas before and now they were put in front of her and she thought, well, maybe that's my way out. And I don't want our kids to have those way outs. I want them to have good virtuous values and morals and ideas to move forward in a healthy way and be constructive members of our society. Thank you. Next we have a vet followed by Melissa, followed by Nicole Haynes. Hi there. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I don't believe that books should be banned and people have the right to choose and read or listen to whatever they want. However, in a classroom setting, material should be appropriate and comfortable for each student to read and write about. I've looked through and read a number of these books. I'm disgusted at the graphic and explicit material that is trying to be passed in our English department. As a parent, I'm very well aware of my child can pull up whatever they want to on the internet. That's not the point. English class is for analyzing the literature with discussions, writing your interpretation of a novel, and vocabulary and grammar. I can't imagine the discussions or essays based on these small glimpses of a few different books, and I apologize. And then he put his hand down her pants and she started moaning. Brad was getting stoned and drunk before school. But he is on top of me and my shout was silenced. Those are the type of books that have no value unless you're looking for the shock value or to sexualize the children. Lastly, my daughter, she's in 10th grade and she's supposed to read a graphic novel that is nothing more than a glorified comic book, first grade reading level. How in the world can these students excel with the standards so low? Reading level is 380. Why is there just such a discrepancy for a gold standard education? And as for the board member or this teacher that was here before, you listed a bunch of books. Let's put those inside of the system, okay? Those are the books we want. Thank you, your time ones. is up. Our next speaker is Melissa, followed by Nicole, followed by Kimberly Cra Crabtree. Hi, I'm Melissa Getzo. I have three children in the district at Granite Bay High School. I'm concerned that our high school teachers are not being permitted to do their jobs and teach our students with their selected curriculum. Teachers are the experts in their field and should not have every piece of supplemental material scrutinized by the board for approval. Such actions are denying our kids the chance to practice being adults in a safe space. Our kids are going to be exposed to situations in their lives that we as parents may not promote or agree with. However, we need to trust our kids based on the upbringing that we have given them all their lives and trust their teachers to help them navigate a world of varied ideas, perspectives, and subject matters, especially when they differ from our own views. That the board should be approving or not approving literature and other learning materials on a piece-by-piece -piece basis does not protect our kids. It stunts their growth. Let our teachers do the good work of expanding their minds with various materials that help them grow and enable them to use their critical thinking skills and practice empathy for others. Parents have the right to opt their children out of activities or instruction within the classroom if they so choose. 
It is totally out of line for a small group of people to determine what is and isn't appropriate in a high school classroom or to override the professional decisions of our teachers. I respectfully ask the board to stop micromanaging the teachers and let them do their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have Nicole, followed by Kimberly, followed by Brandon Delorto. Thank you. I'm Nicole Haynes and I teach at Oakmont High School. I'm in the English department and I have also been part of SILT and many district teams for the last 18 years. And I would like to first appreciate um, being the teacher that I've been able to grow into being, which really has come from a lot of autonomy of being able to choose the curriculum that I'm teaching my students to make the changes that I've made. And there are definitely days where I wish I had a canned curriculum because I might actually go home before six or seven o'clock at night. Um, but at the same time, I value the ability to work with my peers and to mold the things that I do in my classroom and I change them all the time. So after teaching many courses and looking at the files I have over the years, I wish I could say that I'm an expert, so I'm done, but I'm constantly learning and we're going to training and we're working with our peers and colleagues and changing the way that our students change. And my biggest fear is just being in a place that we have to have every single thing that I do in class on an improved list that gets hindered by a process and it becomes stale and stagnant. And that to me would be detrimental to our students if we don't have that real time constant change where we're promoting professional growth. And the other side of it is that we do need parent input, but for me, that parent input begins with talking to me as the classroom teacher um, and talking with my PLT and our checks and balances system, as Julie pointed out, being accountable for us. To me, it starts from the bottom up where I work with my PLT, I work with my department, my site admin oversees us. Thank you, your time is up. Kimberly, followed by Brandon, followed by Lisa Mendenhall. Uh, I'm Kimberly Crabtree, Granite Bay parent, and I want desperately to trust the teachers. I attended back to school last night, of which it was obvious that three of my son's four teachers hold opposing views to mine. Uh, they represented themselves as being caring and passionate about their subjects, but I can't trust their judgment. The existing curriculum approval process lacks adherence to the correct protections against introducing indoctrination and ideological propaganda in the classroom. We're finding inappropriate, offensive, or below grade level materials in our curriculum daily. You should know this as we email you every time we find a piece. In my experience, sorry, site council is a hand-picked echo chamber. SILT is a Game of Thrones style tribunal where those that don't toe the line get patronized and disregarded, leaving, unfortunately, board meetings as the battlefield for opposition. Re-education and a rewrite of the appropriate guardrails are necessary. For instance, uphold laws like the federal law on obscenity. RJU violates two sections on the regular in their transfer of obscene material to minors. Strengthen policy 6141 on curriculum alignment to district mission and goals, and 6144 regarding controversial issues. We rely on you to do your elected jobs, follow the laws, and approve processes that deliver a trusted and highly high quality educational experience. I do appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you, next up is Brandon, followed by Lisa, followed by Greg Hill. Thanks. I've um, been a teacher in this district for 33 years, and I'm proud to have been part of this. It's one of the most amazing districts around, despite the fact, or in spite of the fact, that we don't seem to have overarching board policies that regulate every decision that we do curriculum-wise. The districts that do have some of those overarching, very kind of complete processes, I don't think are the districts we want to necessarily emulate. I think it's good to coordinate things. I think it's good that we can actually have our processes. But if we're going to come up with an actual curriculum that offends nobody anywhere, anytime, I think we're going to have one that motivates nobody anywhere, anytime. Teaching is one of the hardest jobs to do because you have so many different needs in every single classroom of 35, 36, 37, 38. Some kids need to be pushed, some need to be supported, some need to be cajoled, and all of them have different kind of parental expectations to come in. And our job is to negotiate as best we can through the process. It is almost impossible because one of the problems in America at first at this time we're in 
is that we all are getting dragged into the vortex of the political culture wars that are very, very successful for politicians all over the place. And we're getting into this process also. But if you really want to kill, uh, kill education as fast as you can, make it so laborious that any time that any of us want to come up with a new way to do something, a new article from Smithsonian or any other new thing, we have to go through a process that is going to take months. You will stop education dead in its tracks. And sadly, while I will not argue that we are not the owners of kids, we do share them. And I do not want to teach in a system where your teachers do not care about their kids as if they were their own also. They're ours to help, too. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Lisa, followed by Greg, followed by Tra Tracy Henderson, or maybe it's Trey, one of the two. Hi, I'm Lisa Mendenhall. I'm an Oakmont parent. My daughter will be graduating. She's the third of my children to go through. First one graduated in 2009, so I've been in the district for many years. My mom was the high school teacher for over 30 years here in Placer County, so I grew up watching the accountability that she had to her principals and administration um, and her, um, her way of finding a way to engage those kids and really have her own teaching style. So I applaud the teachers and everything that you do to make it an engaging um, opportunity for our kids to learn in the classroom. What my concern is, is that with the uh, influx of the materials in our English literature um, around sexually explicit, pornographic, descriptive rape, and child molestation, we are painting pictures for kids that may not have had exposure to this. And as one of the other parents um, spoke about earlier, what does that mean to somebody who's experienced that firsthand when they're reading this in front of their peers? Um, this has no place in our classrooms, and we have to have a policy not to micromanage the teachers, but to have a policy to eliminate this type of material from our, uh, from our classrooms. I find it ironic that today we received an email from the district about financial, er, financial sex extortion schemes from the FBI warning us about the th over 3,000 minor victims that have been targeted in the past year alone across the United States and in partnership with the Homeland Security uh, Investigations and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is issuing this national public safety alert. Thank you, your time is up. <clears throat> Next speaker is Greg Hill, followed by Tracy, followed by Susan Carmen. Okay, Tracy left. So, Susan, followed by Shannon Canta. Greg Hill? left. I'm here. Oh, okay. You, which one are you? So I get it. Tracy. Tra Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. Good evening. My name is Tracy Henderson. I'm a parent of a junior. I'm in high school. I'm a licensed California attorney. I'm the founder of California Parents Union. I have been asked by parents in this district to put you on official notice of the legal violations that the curriculum that you call English literature is happening in this district. Books like The Bluest Eye, Perks, of being a wildflower are actually approved for use in your classroom. Perks writes in detail about a graphic rape scene, incest, drugs, date rape. You heard from Ms. Rogers in explicit detail as to what actually happened in that book, The Bluest Eye. The acts of biting the tits, the molest, the rape of a little girl are undisputably violations of the law. In case you're wondering, Unlawful sexual intercourse is an act of sexual intercourse accomplished with a person who is not your spouse who's a minor. That's Penal Code Section 261.5. Rape, in case you're wondering if the bluest eye is actually rape, rape is defined under the law, is an act of sexual intercourse accomplished with a person incapable of giving legal consent. Minors are incapable of giving legal consent. That act in that book was rape. Now that you're aware of some of the basic laws in our state, there's many, many more, I implore you to ask yourselves, why are you allowing educators to put these thoughts in minors' minds? Why? I can think of one reason, because they're trying to normalize these acts in an effort to groom them so when an adult tries that on them, it's normal. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Su Susan Carmon, followed by Shannon followed by Renee Rogers. Hi, I'm allergic to confrontation, so I'm going to be pretty mellow here. I am a proud parent of uh, Oakmont grad and a current Oakmont student. Um, 
I am also very, very fortunate to be a teacher at Oakmont High School. I actually tried um, 16 years before I was hired here to get into the district and was turned away because I was too young and inexperienced. That is one of the things I love about this district is that you hire amazing teachers, quite honestly. I thought it was really interesting, the number of teachers who are up here who have students that also attend in this district. There are actually a good number of us who um, have such respect for our peers that we also do out of district transfers. My boys are on an out of district transfer and I couldn't be happier with the education that they have received. Um, and the reason that um, we educators are happy to have our children educated here is that we know our peers are intentional with their curriculum and we know that their choices are definitely educationally defensible. Um, basically, I'm thankful for all the trust and support of all of the parents of my students. It's very hard for me to not fall madly in love with my students. I feel very strongly about them, even though that they're not my actual children, they kind of are. I value the diversity in my classes and I work to respect all of their views, whether or not they agree with mine. It doesn't matter. Every opinion in my class is important. And I look forward Thank to the you. Your time is up. Discuss. Thank you. <clears throat> Shannon, followed by Renee, followed by, I think it's Ryan Jolson. Hi. My name is Shannon Catanella. I have a freshman uh, over at Granite Bay. Um, I wanted to say that on one of the slides, the, two, the last bullet at the very end was far too small. And it said that we should always consider the context under which these teachers are teaching the materials. I think that needs to move all the way up so we can take the temperature of these conversations all the way down. Um, I think you'll find that the excerpts quoted tonight on multiple occasions are not in books actually assigned in full. Please remember that essay excerpts exist to compare and contrast linguistic styles and themes. I think you had to have the conversations with the teachers to find out why they're assigning these materials and if these excerpts are actually being tackled. What are the students saying if they are doing it? I want to know what those discussions are. Please remember that we do have more things in common than not. And shielding high school students from the world puts those kids at a disadvantage. Controlling the teachers' activities, lessons, trickles down to robotic instruction where we need nimble teachers inspiring them in the classroom every day to keep them safe. And I know they want them to be safe because I know there are things out there where they're paying attention to the kids on TikTok and they're advising them on how to stay safe. And they're watching kids who, who are school shooters and they're trying to keep all, they want to keep your kids safe. They want to keep them alive. This is a horrible environment. And I think it's, it's doing a great disservice to not lift these teachers up and celebrate them and trust them and see who they are and who they're trying to create your students to be. Because in no way are topics like rape, incest, and racism promoted. On this, we all agree. Thank you. Your time is up. They're not promoted. Renee, followed by Ryan, followed by Dylan Jackson. Remember, when I call your name, make your way down so we have a fast transition. Renee left. Okay. Ryan, are you here? Okay. So after Ryan will be Dylan Jackson and then Nicole Boyce. Um, hello, I am Ryan Jackson and I'm a junior at West Park currently. Um, I've had the honor of being one of the captains for our school's uh, cross country team as well as being involved in my school with the athletic council that we have going on. So throughout my time at West Park, I am proud to say that I've been exposed and taught through an array of texts and materials within their AP Lang, AP Euro History, and uh, AP US History classes. Um, through my time at high school, my teachers have been by my side, supporting me through more than just education, but also through life and the roadblocks that come along with you know, um, my experiences. So I would like to argue that teachers at individual schools would know and understand that their students' academic, cultural, and social char characteristics much better than many figures within students' daily lives. I trust them to have not just mine, but also my fellow classmates with their best interests in mind. By restricting information to students, to, it undermines the primary function of education, which is enabling students to think independently for themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Dylan, followed by Nicole, followed by Melissa McDonald. 
Hi, my name is Dylan Jackson. I'm a parent. I'm actually Ryan's dad. Um, I'm actually serving on the West Park School Site Council, and I'm also involved with the Athletic Boosters program itself. Um, I kind of wanted to diffuse it a little bit and talk about one of my favorite movies, which is Top Gun. Top Gun was the best volleyball movie I've ever seen in my life. We can all agree that that short it had a full scene, it had its own music track, but we all agree that did not represent the entire movie. I feel like a lot of people who have been talking here tonight are bringing clips out of books. They're saying this one part is very offensive, but not analyzing the entire text. I feel like our teachers do have their students' best interests at heart. I feel like they are trying to teach them new things, critical thinking, ability to compare and contrast. And I think we need to trust our teachers to have the right choice for it. If a parent doesn't feel these are the right choices, they can have their kids opt out. But I do not want my son and my incoming daughter to have their learning abilities restricted by other parents' opinions of what can be approved, what's offensive for my kids, and not allowing them to make their own decisions. So please keep in mind, please consider the parent's choice. Please consider having the children to have their ability to choose their own information and not make attempts to censor what they're learning. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole, followed by Melissa, followed by Misha Jones. I don't know if Misha Jones. Hi. Um, picture a buffet filled with your most favorite foods, your family's favorite foods, everyone's favorite foods. Perhaps there are new foods you have yet to try. This buffet is curated by top rated chefs and highly educated dietitians and physicians. The best foods are brought in to make this buffet. Then, a group asserts that their diet of white bread and margarine is best for everyone. The buffet is re reduced to white bread and margarine. Your favorite foods are now gone, no longer an option for you to enjoy. New foods that could have expanded your palate and allowed for connections with others are gone. There is only white bread and margarine. It is not right to assert that the preferences of some are best for all. Much like passing on a food item at a buffet line, parents have the option to opt out of books for their children. My kid's diet is not to be dictated by the preferences of some, nor shall their school curriculum. We need to respect our teachers as the highly edu educated professionals they are and entrust them in educating and enriching our children's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, file, followed by, I think it says Mesa. Melissa, there are two Melissas right Oh, two Melissas, okay, and then followed by Michelle, Michelle Tong. Good evening, um, Melissa McDonald, nice to see all of you. I wanna start by thanking you. As a former trustee, I understand probably more than anybody in the audience what you're going through and what you're sitting through. So thank you for giving all of us this opportunity. I just wanna acknowledge that. Having stated that I was a trustee, I understand and have experienced what you guys are going through. I've sat through curriculum adoption. We have had, in Eureka, we had teachers teaching things that were considered inappropriate on both sides of the aisle, so to speak. But what I can say as a trustee is I didn't get involved. Our board wasn't involved in that. And the reason for that is because as capacity builders, as governing board members, we trusted our district administrators and our school site administrators to have processes and infrastructure to deal with these things when they came up. Because let's be honest, it's not gonna stop. There's always gonna be something happening at some school that somebody finds objectionable, right? If you don't have processes in place with the people on the ground, then you can't possibly micromanage that. And I only have a little bit more time but I just wanna say again how much respect I have for our teachers and our district cabinet. They are the experts, they are credentialed, this is their day job, they know what they're doing. Please govern, don't manage. Be the trustees that we were trained to be at CSBA and just let them do their jobs. So the second Melissa, which I butchered your name when I tried to read it, then Michelle and then Tamara. Good evening. We have exceptional IB and AP teachers in particular in our district, and they're highly qualified and hardworking, and it's incredibly challenging to do the job that they do. Those teachers are in high demand. They have a lot of options, and it's essential to our, the success of our schools and our students that we can recruit and retain those teachers. I'm very concerned that we will lose talent and not be able to attract talent if this board takes action to micromanage these teachers or limit their ability to do their job successfully. 
This district is getting a very bad reputation in the community and in the region, and I'm concerned that actions to ban books and materials is going to further damage that reputation. People will think twice before moving to our school district or our area, and enrollment will suffer, as will our property values. I know a school board is different in many ways from a board of directors that runs a company, but there are similarities. And a good school board, like a good board of directors, should be focusing on setting strategic direction and taking actions to strengthen the organization. Here are schools. A board of directors that micromanages staff, that substitutes its judgment for the experts in the company, or here, the expert in our schools, the teachers. A board that does that is an ineffective board that doesn't know or understand its role. We have many processes in place for parents to opt out of classes, to request different materials for their children, et cetera. Please do your job and let the teachers do theirs. Thank you, Michelle, followed by Tamara, followed by Meg. Hi, good evening. Um, I wanna echo what Shannon said about the context of the curriculum. I think that's very important. And I'm angered that our teachers are called predators, indoctrinators, and attempting to groom our students. Even someone here tonight is attempting to intimidate the teachers by asking for names of the teachers who put forth the list of supplemental materials. I'll tell you who you can call the college board. The bluest eyes is on the AP reading list. I can pull out horrible passages in the Bible, things worse than any of those materials. Does that mean that students shouldn't read the Bible? When you pull out a snippet of something, you lose the larger meaning. I believe that the board is overreaching and requiring board approval on all supplemental materials. You already have a process in place for supplemental curriculum review. And it is not a task the board should take on. And I have to imagine none of you really want to do that. You don't want to be the judge and jury. That's why we have teachers and we have amazing teachers, principals, district staff, and superintendents. It's like asking the Supreme Court to review a case at the, at the county level. It's not necessary. There's already a place in process for students to opt out of curriculum when parents are, uh, find uh, material offensive. Um, as Ms. Hirota pointed out, what is offensive is subjective. Um, sorry, I'm running out of time here, but please carefully think about this process before you make any decisions that will make you, you managers of the curriculum and not the governing board. Thank you. Tamara, followed by Meg, followed by Violet. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am the mother of a graduate from Granite Bay High School as well as a freshman that just started this year. I'd really like to thank the teachers from one fellow frontline worker to another. I know what you've been through in the last several years has been unprecedented and I truly admire your commitment to our children and doing what's best for them. Uh, I loved English so much as an, a high school student that I kept taking classes in college despite being a bio-sci major. I ended up with a second major in English literature. Part of English literature is not only analysis, it's not only complexity of the language, but it's also context. That's been echoed numerous times. So taking a single passage out of context doesn't speak to the truth of what that material is discussing. The bluest eye is something I actually studied numerous times. Um, it's a story about what our definitions of beauty are and what it is to grow with shame. Shame from a variety of sources, including unfortunately rape and molestation. I'm also a healthcare worker, so if we wanna talk about numbers, we should keep in mind that there are victims of child sex abuse that number somewhere in the range of one in four students. Seeing yourself in literature is really important. We know that that improves kids' ability to deal with difficult factors, and guided by the professional teachers, we should trust the process. And as far as data goes, our AP numbers and test scores kind of speak to the value of the education our kids have been getting. Thank, Thank you. you. Next is Meg, followed by, followed by Violet, followed by Ranjani. A couple words came up tonight, appropriate and objectionable, what's proper, what's explicit. We all define that differently. I urge you to listen to the parents who are speaking on behalf of all students, not just the ones who tend to fall into categories that they align with. 
don't change the entire curriculum approval process to appease a group of extremist parents who already have the ability to exercise their parental rights. Any parent can review the curriculum and opt out of any material they find unsuitable. Any parent can challenge material for reconsideration with the complaint form that's online. Any parent can go to a teacher. Any parent can go to a principal. There are processes in place. We don't need the board overriding all of that already um, effective processes. Um, I, I just, I, I just, these people's values don't dictate, my, they should not dictate my students' learning experience. There's a political movement in our country. I think what we see represented is this political movement. People want to come out and push something they've heard to push at the board level, and they're trying to do that. And it's coming at the expense of my students, who I want to have an open public education where things can be discussed freely, where books can be re read freely. And that's just not going to happen if you let these parents continue to try to change things. Thank you. Next is Violet, followed by Ranjani, followed by Carrie. You can pull that all the way down. There you go. Hi, my name is Violet Wilcox, and I think that teachers and students sh sh should pick out books for the classroom and the library because, well, some kids never went to the library or they either went to it once or twice. So I think they should have the freedom to read whatever they want at school. Also, teachers basically w went to school to learn what to let the students read. Thank you very much for coming. You notice I allowed an exception for those claps. So um, next is Ranjani, followed by Carrie, followed by Nicole. But did Nicole already speak? Did you have two cards? If not, Nicole's after that. I'll move this up a little bit. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ranjani Kalyan. Thank you so much for the opportunity, at least to, from a parent's perspective, to be able to uh, connect with you at the board level. Um, you know, my family emigrated to the U.S. Uh, for its value of liberty and freedom. Uh, and what does this liberty and freedom mean? You know, the state of being free within the society from oppressive restrictions. And the freedom is the power to act, speak, and think as one without hindrance or restraints. As a parent of a sophomore in Roosevelt Joint and a seventh grader in the, in the EUSD about soon to join Roosevelt Joint, and having had received a well-rounded education growing up in Florida, I value and trust educators in our school districts to provide a well-rounded global education to our children. I, ex I hope and um, anticipate that the board could represent these values as well. And in this global economy, our children just need to be able to communicate at multiple levels with students across the globe. Uh, we, you know, according to the state uh, statistics, we have more than a million international students coming into the U.S. And if uh, we need to be able to compete at, at the global level, and we need to be able to allow our teachers to be able to communicate with the children with the experiences that they've had and what they can offer to the children. The children in our community, in our districts, are very intelligent and the exposure to various uh, sources are very Thank very you, important. your time is up. Carrie, followed by Nicole, Nicole Boyce, uh, followed by Emma. Hello, my name is Carrie, I have two children at Granite Bay High School. I have both a freshman and a junior. And I'm here because I think that this is so important and I respect everybody here feels passionate about the information that they're bringing and about their own viewpoints. But the reality is, is that if, as Ms. Friends noted, the education, the SILT committee, 
the, vo the volume of material that they have to review, it's not practical for anyone to read that volume in a short amount of time. That is why we spend so much time and energy in recruiting and hiring very well-trained and capable teachers, teachers who are passionate about the subjects that they're teaching, who are passionate about educating children. And we have to trust them to bring those supplemental materials to us. There's already a process in place for review, as was already pointed out as well. And as I believe it was Ms. Vaughn pointed out with regard to um, the Lexiles and the materials, my freshman read one of the graphic novels that has been widely complained about, American Born Chinese, and that was one of her most educationally challenging lessons, although she's a very advanced reader because the material is about more than just reading. It's about understanding in many different forms and taking that in. And without our education and background knowing that, we don't have the experience or the expertise. To Thank you. That. Your time is up. Nicole? followed by Emma, followed by Lori. Okay, I thought I saw her name before. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, em so hang on, Emma, followed yeah. by Lori, followed by Cheryl. Hi, I'm Emma Weiss. I graduated in the B class of 2021 from Granite Bay High School. And I've seen a lot of arguments on both sides of this issue. And I think that there's value in both of them. Um, but by banning all of these pieces from the curriculum, you will lose a lot of value that is held in those pieces that may not be inappropriate for students to read. Even the, it, um, even the content that is valuable is the content that pulls us in the most. I, obviously I was there very recently, um, and Every time that issues that we are seeing constantly around us, we go on social media, we talk about things with our friends, a lot of us have dealt with issues that are talked about specifically in these works. It gives us a great environment to process it with our peers, with adult supervision. And there are processes in place to prevent teachers from abusing that power. And if you want to strengthen those processes, I would be very supportive of that but it should not come at the expense of our students' educations. Thank you. Thank you. So next is Lori, followed by Cheryl. Then I have one card for two speakers, which would be Laura and Gabriella. My name is Lori, and I'm not here because I'm concerned about the teachers. My kids have had great teachers. I have a senior in the district and I have a seventh grader that I'm homeschooling. Um, this is not appropriate for children. Before he could register his surprise, she grabbed his arms and pushed him to the bed. This is multiple excerpts from one book. Not since their first night together had he been this timid, afraid of her unfamiliar body, the full figured flesh so different from how he had described his wife. He, excited now, he pushed into her, and she squeezed her eyes as tightly as she could, her tongue circling her lips. He pushed harder, his breathing heavy and labored. She scratched his back, and he cried out. She bit his ear and pulled his hair. He pushed against her as through he was trying to move through her, and when she opened her eyes to look at him, she saw something like pain written across his face, and the ugliness of the act, the sweat and blood and wetness of they both produced became illuminated, and she knew that she was an animal tonight. Then he was too. He pet her on a fold. He put her on a folded tarp, spread her legs, and entered her. She screamed, but he placed his hand over her lips. Then he put his fingers in her mouth. For the entire week ahead, for the entire week after, his body had taken over the excuse making for him. Thank you. Your time is up. Cheryl, followed by what Laura and What are we normalizing in five years? Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Cheryl Don Bay High School, who is the president of the Drama Club. I also am a booster member of the Drama Department and 
40 more people would have been here to speak, but they are, have a, a rehearsal for a weekly a play that's a week from now. So they asked me to complete lack of understanding that discussion is integral to the exploration of these works. The critics seem to think students are given the material and left to their devices. If that is, not, if that is their assumption, then they're insulting the education and the ability of professional teachers. Many, most of the works are approved by the College Board and are required for the students to be able to pass the IB and IP, AP exams. To remove them is in effect cutting off the resources of teachers who are expected to provide adequate, adequate instruction to that end. So thank you so much and I really um, appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Our last speakers are Laura and Gabriella. Are you speaking together or separately? Okay. Good evening. I hope you remember Laura and I. It's good to see that nothing has changed since we've graduated. I wanted to circle back to the discussion of sex ed in the curriculum, the one that uh, we had to face as freshmen. Our teachers, ones that we both admire, are doing their jobs. Parents nor the board can step on their toes. They are more than qualified and we can vouch as past students. Uh, the curriculum is quite disappointing. The current curriculum fails to prepare students for the real world where sex, drugs, violence do exist. And as college students, we experience it and know it. In addition to the comment made about the appropriateness of the N-word in English class was very appalling. It is highly offensive, emotionally triggering, and the world should not be used in an academic setting. That is not a topic that is up for discussion. I know from experience that the process of approval right now is very political and very slow. It has been six years since RJUHSD has yet to update the sex ed curriculum to be compliant to the California Healthy Youth Act. It is time the board prioritizes students, their education, and not the politics of a very few and particular parents. Thank you. Both. Well, look at that. We did it in exactly an hour like we had planned. So uh, now it's our time to um, have our discussion. And I'd like to start with our two student board members. I got it. <laughs> Is this okay? I am speaking to my own experience here at Antelope High School. In 2022, I took both AP Language and AP Literature within my junior and senior year. Being in an AP course, my teachers obviously had to follow College Board's guides and limits. Within both classes, I read relevant speeches, short stories, poems, and books that have not only made me college and career ready, but ready for life. My teachers are like many in the audience, parents who truly care for their students. My teachers carefully select texts that will educate us in all aspects. And I believe my teachers are appropriately setting us up for success. Based on my experience at Antelope, I undoubtedly trust my teachers to select the proper materials for my education. In AP Literature, I read the short story, The Paper Menagerie by Ken Liu. It is a short story speaking to racism, trafficking, cultural identity, and specifically being biracial. I'm not sure what tier the approval of the text falls into, but I do know that I cannot imagine my English learning without it. While reading it in class, my peers and myself included found ourselves crying because of how much it moved us. The story mentions familiar racial slurs that I've been called growing up, familiar feelings that I felt as a person of color, and a familiar story that other students have gone through. My, bi my biracial peer took the story home to his white mom to which she was able to sympathize with him for his story. I read Beloved by Toni Morrison, a novel speaking to slavery and generational trauma. Beloved raised important questions and conversations that led us to mature and difficult conversations within my senior English class that are needed. Between the paper menagerie and Beloved, I was able to analyze complex ideas and expand my understanding and comprehension. Within my classes, I've been exposed to the realities that are human. The struggles and the triumphs, the thick and the thin, our education should not be censored. With Antelope being one of the most diverse schools in the district, I find it important for our curriculum to be diverse in order to cater to all students. Not only have I learned about race, gender inequalities, et cetera, I've learned about empathy, cultural awareness, acceptance, simply traits that all students should be equipped with when walking into the real world. Again, based on my experience at Antelope, I undoubtedly trust my teachers to select the proper materials for my education. 
Um, my name is Kamea Kaloma. I am from West Park High School. I would preface this with the fact that I have been pulling this together as this meeting has gone on, so I hope this is somewhat um, has a good line of reasoning. <laughs> Um, I am from West Park, which is a totally system in its own in this district. We are not assigned books in our English classes in the same way as other schools. We are very much valued choice. Um, in my AB Lit class, we read only one book as an entire class, and the rest were simply within an era. For example, modernist, postmodern, contemporary, etc. I read books such as All Men Are Mortal, um, Madame Bovary, Beloved, all these things, but we also had a choice. Um, we are given a myriad of ways to digest a wide range of books, book clubs from different perspectives, styles, comprehension levels, individual reading, and as a class. In doing this, I think we adhere to a, this concept of our personal definitions of appropriateness. I don't think the answer is necessarily limiting books, but expanding the options. But simultaneously, I do not think that we need to allow our children to be uncomfortable. We need to allow our children to be uncomfortable. We need opinions, perspectives, and experiences. The good, the positive, the pure, but also the dark and sometimes inappropriate. I think that's where we gain the most depth, the most growth. I think English should not just be complexity, but context. So much of critical thinking is actually understanding and actively seeking out context, bias, and nuance. Someone said earlier tonight that we are doing students a disservice in shielding them. We are subject to these concepts and experiences in much more extreme forms of exposure outside of the classroom. Balancing the comfortable with the uncomfortable and opposing concepts in a safe environment a place where we have trained experts and simultaneously diverse set of peers at our disposal as we discuss and deconstruct. Again, discussing, not promoting, allows us to approach these concepts with a greater idea of our own understanding, opinions. I don't think it's, to have, it's going to have a negative impact, but in fact is equipping us to grapple with many topics as we go through life. It almost reminds me of people not saying Voldemort and Harry Potter in prohibition and making things taboo, we raise them to a higher pedestal, or power to be intimidating and make it harder for them to oppose but ironically, also gives them the power to be more alluring. And if shielding us now will not prevent us from being exposed later in life without knowing how to safely approach them. I want to close this with the concept that we are not raising our children to be carbon copies, uh, carbon copies of ourselves, but pushing for progress, building on the shoulders of the last generation, and that requires more than more information, not simply more of this comfortable saying. Thank you. Well. As you know, I've said this many times at board meetings, I, I think our district does an excellent job in educating our students, and I, all of us have kids in the district. I have five, four that have gone out, two that sailed through college and got out early because of the education we provided them. And those who doubt can just look at what we just heard from two of our students to see how well educated we are. Thank you both for your comments. Um, as we get into our discussion, I want to remind everybody that what we're looking at is not banning, not censoring. We're here tonight to look at how does our practice meet or match or not our policy and how does that fit within the state requirements that we have in ed code. Because as a board, we have obligations not only to those who we represent throughout our district, but we have an obligation to follow the law and fulfill our obligations within the ed code. One of which is to develop and approve policies like the policies that we've been talking about. And the other is to approve the curriculum and uh, textbooks. So for those who think there's this big, broad overreach of the board or think we've already taken action to ban or censor, that hasn't happened. What we're really doing is trying to understand where we are, understand the process, and determine whether our policies and practices are appropriate under the ed code and for our students. And there is a fine line between what one person looks at as management or micromanagement and what others look at as oversight and governance and fulfilling obligations under the ed code. And that's what we're trying to do here. You can, this continuum can go from teachers doing everything completely unchecked to parents just choosing everything and teachers having no say, neither one of those is accurate. The answer is somewhere in the middle. And I think the ed code gives us some pretty clear guidance on that. So with that, I'd like the board to discuss where do you feel we need our staff to put their energies in coming back to us with either revisions or changes to the process that we have? Are there gaps that you see 
between the ed code and our policy, our policy and our AR, or our AR and our practice, so that we can then get the input and direct our staff to go out and do the work we need to do to wrap this up. So with that, I'm open to everybody or any of us up here uh, giving your thoughts. And of course, I have lots of thoughts and I'll get back to those at the end. Can, maybe we can formulate some areas of discussion rather than kind of just opening it up that wide. So I don't know, um, <clears throat> for instance, we could go through, we could go through step by step of the areas to improve, or we could, um, you know, kind of identify some bullets that we all would like to talk about. So we can do it in somewhat of an organized fashion. I think staff has provided that. I, I think it'd be best for us to capture what's not on those lists first, okay. if there's concerns of the board, and then we can go to that step. I don't want to limit the discussion if any of us have concerns outside of these handful of bullets. Okay, so we'll start with what's not on the list. Areas that you think we should be looking at. You have, if you need time to think, I've got lots to say, so I can always fill in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I was just going to share some thoughts and then a possible um, process change. I've been quiet because I just am listening and taking all of it in. And I do want to make one comment. Um, and this comes from, you know, everyone knows my mother was a teacher her entire life. My brother is still a teacher. His wife is a teacher. So I get a little, um, it, it makes me very uncomfortable, this word of, you know, whether we're trusting or not trusting teachers. To me, that is very um, divisive and inaccurate. I don't think that there's anyone who doesn't trust the teachers. I think that we all inherently trust all of the teachers, all of the principals. I know that I do. Um, and I think ultimately everyone does. I think it's that there is some disagreement over what might be appropriate. And that's okay. Like one teacher said she maybe wouldn't let her seventh grader read Great Gatsby, but maybe some people would. I let my 11 year old watch PG-13 movies. My neighbors do not, right? That it doesn't mean I don't trust them or they don't trust me or it's that we have a disagreement over what appropriate and inappropriate means. So I guess I ask that we maybe use a different word or that we have language that's more um, positive and acknowledge that it's not, to me, it's not an issue of trust. It's an issue of just acknowledging that we disagree on, on what content is okay and not okay. Um, so that is kind of where I sit. And I think of my own job. My job is to hire and train fitness instructors who go off and teach fitness classes every day, 107 classes a week. In no way do I want to be in the business of micromanaging what they teach, what tools they use. They pop onto YouTube, they get ideas, they need to stay fresh and current every day. I'm not trying to micromanage their curriculum in this case, you know, their, their fitness programs. But what I do have to immediately do as their supervisor is take pause the moment that a participant comes to me and says that either the class is unsafe, they've been injured, the class lacks rigor, the class isn't meeting the needs of my participants who are tax paying members of the city because it's a city government run program. So that is kind of where I feel like I'm at a little bit is we have people, parents, you know, with different opinions who are coming and they have different needs and they have different 
metrics and spectrums of what's appropriate or not. And it's all subjective. There's no way that we're all going to agree. So when I look at this process and areas of improvement, I just go directly back to ed code. What does the ed code say? Like we don't have to guess or make this up because it's already outlined for us. So I look at, you know, this process that had the little arrows that we made up here are every single one of the steps in line with what the ed code says, which is that we're involving substantial teacher involvement and parents and other members of the community. And to me, it looks like the answer is mostly yes, but I think it's a matter of the time being given. Do we have time to look and read through some of the books, as you pointed out? Do we have time to really, in this process, let the community know that this process is happening? Here's where it starts. You're going to have 30 days, and then we're going to have this many days. And if everyone has ample notice and then time where parents who want to be involved can be involved, then I think, to me, that's where I see the biggest area of improvement is now we have parents who want to be involved that never necessarily wanted to be involved before. And I think that goes back to what you said, Julie, is that if we look at the SILT process six years ago, it's a hundred times better now. Part of the reason it's a hundred times better is that we have parent involvement we didn't have before. And so now that's creating a new challenge. So I guess in conclusion, <laughs> I think adding more time for parents or, or teachers or whoever wants to be able to look through and read through and find areas so that we avoid situations like the book that was read tonight. I don't know what it's called. So anyway, that's my thoughts about it. Thank you. Would either of you like to would either of you like to jump in right now? You can keep thinking. Okay. Well, I I, I kind of have a comment about I, I like what you said. I think I agree with I think maybe all of it, Heidi. <laughs> and the and the part, well, I'm getting there, Pete. Um I think the part that's has started to cause a lot of the conversation is somewhere in the SILT review where parents are becoming involved, where there hasn't been as much parental involvement before other than the LCAP process. And my question would be, and I can't remember how it was said, um, but I liked what was said, you know, when, when there's a disagreement, that doesn't mean you throw the whole thing out, but it doesn't mean you also adopt to aid in that disagreement, right? Um, and that's the process that I think I'd like to not define myself, but get more definition about how to improve that part. For instance, it gets to silt, there's parent input. Some parents are like, I don't, I don't want that anymore, or I don't think, I don't agree with that. What does that conversation look like? And what does the district do to put parameters around that? Does that make sense? Like this is, within the parameters and this is outside of the parameters and if it fits within the parameters, it keeps moving forward. Um, I think that's hard to do because every type of curriculum is so different, but that's what I think I would look for is where in that parent involvement process is there flexibility for parents to be heard at the same time um, there is a uh, designation by the teachers that is followed, by the faculty that's followed. That's a hard one. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Or okay. It does. So I think as we look at this, one, um, you know, we've had the discussion, do we have an effective process? And that's what kind of got us here and looking for this alignment or misalignment. But I can say this, if we have 600 courses that we don't know if they've been approved because we don't have evidence of it, we don't have an effective process. So fortunately our staff has done an audit. We know out of 704 or whatever it is, I think 85% of that is 
almost exactly 600. You know, if we have that 600, we have work to do. Uh, I want to say, uh, I've mentioned it a number of times, we trust our teachers. If we didn't trust them, we wouldn't employ them. You know, we trust our teachers to teach our kids and they do a great job. Uh, and I'm a teacher of sorts. I'm a professor at a university. And I can tell you, I'm also a department chair, so I approve all the curriculum for everything in my department. I can tell you that I can have the most planned out day with my classes and drive into work. I'll stop at Starbucks, like I always do, and start reading the paper. And there'll be something in the paper that makes me change all of my lectures for that day because it's current, it's important, and it is literally right on point to what we're talking about. And so I think we have to have that flexibility in our classes. Now, where I think we need to work on things. One is, as I just mentioned, we've had an audit. We know we have some issues with um, no evidence of approval. That doesn't mean they weren't approved. They may, may very well have been approved, but we don't know when. Um, and so I do think we need to come up with a work plan of how are we going to attack? 600 is a large number. How are we going to approach that in a way where we're not delaying the curriculum approval of new courses that we want to get out to our students and we have an effective manner of tracking the curriculum and reviewing it on a timely basis whether that time span is whatever three years five years whatever the number it happens to be accurate i think we also have to look at things like are we promoting the involvement of teachers, are we, I mean, parents, are we just notifying them? Because there's a big difference between the two of those. And the Ed Code does say that we shall promote the involvement of parents. But it also says substantial teacher involvement in the selection. So that is a very important part. As, it, as it's been said, our teachers are experts in a lot of areas. Some are experts in curriculum, others are not. Some are experts, as we heard, in math, but not English or, or any of the other subjects. So, so we have to find who are the right people to be doing the right thing at the right time, and how do we engage and promote the engagement of our parents, because we have that obligation. I think we have to, I think probably the biggest struggle we're gonna have is the ed code talks about the instructional materials and it talks about textbooks and supplementals, but there's this big gray line of what is and how do you interpret supplementals. And I think that's something we have to wrestle with. And that is going to take a lot of conversation with our teachers because what I don't wanna do is take away the ability to talk about current events that can connect the students in a meaningful level with what they're learning because I do believe they learn more when it's connected to the real world, world around them. So it's gonna take some work, but I think we can help find where that line is. Oh, I don't think we need to look at every piece of paper, every comment, uh, that just wouldn't be practical in any world. I think we also have to look at our timelines for approval process. You know, when we get, whether it's SILT or site council or here at the board, you get a stack of stuff this tall and you have two or three days to look it over. And that's assuming you have nothing else going on in your personal or professional life. So we have to have the time to do this well. We have to give our teachers the time to develop well. We have to give our parents time to be involved in the process. And we have to give our various committees and our board the time to do things in a manner that will be effective and promote the, ex the education of our students. I do get a little concerned when we talk about SILT and sort of people had to leave the room before there was discussion and things like that. I do think that the SILT process, we should be looking at that and that should be an open and transparent process. We shouldn't have everything transparent except for this one little middle part. And I've never been to them, I don't know how they go. All I know is someone said a bunch of teachers had to leave because they couldn't sit through it. I don't think that's appropriate. So we have to figure out how can we uh, have a process if we really want everybody, our teachers and our parents to be involved, how we can have an open and transparent process. 
I don't want to make it so technical that we say, okay, you have to follow the Brown Act and we hand tie everybody to not be able to do things. But I think we can look at things like the Brown Act to see, so what are good practices for transparency and openness? And I think we need to follow those. The other thing I heard today, and I've brought this up previously in other policy areas, is sort of differences from site to site versus district wide. And I think as some of these big, broad policy issues, we have to be clear and have a district wide perspective on how we do stuff because a process that is appropriate at one school should be appropriate at another school. And if it's inappropriate at one school, it should be inappropriate at another school. So we should work to make sure we have a, um, a fair process that is utilized in the same manner across our schools. We're educating over 10,000 students. We have to be doing it in a clear and consistent manner. And then I just want to go back to what I said in the very, very beginning is we really have to look, is it our practice? Is it our policy? Or is it really, are there things in ed code that need to be changed? Because as a board, one of our charges as board members is to advocate for policies on behalf of our district and our, our the people we represent at the state capitol. So all of those should be things that we should look for as options for us going forward. But I think those are sort of the buckets where we need to look. And, and again, I don't want to make a decision tonight. This is really about information gathering and kind of identifying areas. Uh, I think this conversation needs to continue, but not be kicked down the road for months and months and months. I think we have to be intentional and practical about following through on this and getting to a place where our public, our teachers, and our students have predictability in what we're doing and certainty in the process. Okay, so my silence and my thought process here was um, what I was struggling, what I've been, what I was struggling with, and how you start kicked us off was I'm not sure if our board policy is working or not. So um, I don't know that answer. So I don't know if is is do we have a problem with um, not being specific enough, being too gen Are we are we? Um, are we so general in this board policy that that's why we are faced with some challenges right now? Um, I wonder, um, can we create guardrails for our teachers, which creates a trust um, for the parents that, for, for all of our, for all of us, we, we should have some guardrails. Um, but then if we have the guardrails, then can we just let the teachers handle this just-in-time teaching, because I think we all agree um, an excellent education is a teacher that can be a little autonomous and bring in important um, points of the day, especially if, if you're in social, social sciences when you have um, new developments. And um, I, I, want, I think we all want, um, I heard other, the parents that were complaining about some of the books, they want to trust the teachers. So can we just, cr can we create guide, the guide rails in some way to create that, help that trust? Um, and then I also wonder, I was listening to some other comments from parents because they didn't want us to restrict the information in the classroom. And, and are we really stopping a conversation if we just say it's not okay to have really graphic, sexually explicit material? Are we really stopping conversations and material when we, when we say that? Um, it, it seems like, I, 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 do parents want to have that conversation in the classroom with their kids? I, I, I'm not sure if they're trying to pull for that or not. Um, and one thing that I just want to bring up with, uh, it's actually a sex ed value, it's, it's um, sex ed code. Um, in its 51937, um, it says the legislature recognizes that while parents and guardians overwhelmingly support medically accurate, comprehensive sex education, parents and guardians have the ultimate responsibility for imparting values regarding human sexuality to their children. And I think um, the concern that when we hear parents and they're reading these excerpts, and I think we all agree that none of it's great, we don't want that. We don't want to listen to it. I don't want to listen to it. Um, what, 
we do, that's kind of imparting values. If we normalize it, if we're constantly bringing it up, if it's now being discussed in the classroom, um, we're normalizing behavior that some parents may not want those values imparted. And so I think we need to be, I appreciate what you said with, with um, as we have concerns with, with books, that it's not taking away options, it's maybe expanding choice. But I think we need to be really careful about what's required in the classroom and what is a choice. And I don't know if our board policy honors that or not, um, but maybe that's, that's something that I've been thinking about is required versus choice. And, you know, I'm hearing that that kids can, parents can just opt their kids out of everything. Like, I, my kids never had a choice to not do anything in the classroom. And I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine going up to a teacher and saying, I don't want my child to do this lesson. Because first of all, my kid will worry about, well, I, you know, I don't want to speak about my own kids. Like, they'll just get mad at me. But um, it, I don't think um, it is that common to really allow parents to go in and to say, no, I don't like this. Um, it didn't happen at back to school night <laughs> to say, if you don't like anything, let me know. Um, those are my thoughts. Anyway, was that related to board policy? I don't know. I'm, I'm I, I want to comment on that, you know, where you started because you, you had mentioned about the policies, right? And first, I also want to go back and um, thank you, Dr. Moore and your team. You, you've done an excellent job. We, we put the cabinet to task, I feel like it's been about a year now, and it started with, maybe it was ethnic studies, of going and starting to do an audit on what exactly is being taught, how is it consistent across all the classes, and what does that look like? And so I applaud you for doing this because I think it was a monumental task to get to this point, and you've been very transparent with us on what you found and what you didn't find, and so thank you for that. And I wonder if, <clears throat> with the knowledge that we have, if we've even given the opportunity for the policies to work now that we know what, what, where we're at, right? We've got a measurement of where we're at. Have we given the policies an opportunity to work? And some people might say, well, they've been there all the time and you haven't let, they haven't been working. Well, that's not true because we haven't given the policies an opportunity to work with this knowledge, with this board, and with this cabinet and with this kind of input. And I wonder if our policies are already very good and um, define exactly what needs to be done. And we've gotten a lot of input through this time about what people want and what people don't want to see, and I think that knowledge might go far. And so I, I don't know. That's just kind of where I'm at thinking about it now from an audit standpoint. I'll just, I'm going to piggyback off both of you just to say that I think, to your point about, I, I don't think I've ever had a child be able to opt out of something either. Maybe I did. I don't, I don't know. Um, it doesn't sound familiar, but a parent, again, has to have time, back to my original point, there has to be time to read what that curriculum is to then be able to make the choice that I want to opt out. And so if I were to see, you know, that particular book that was quoted, yeah, I would opt out of that. But then what's the alternative being given and do we have time to look at that? So then that is where it gets a little convoluted, messy, you know, and some people might be comfortable with it and other parents aren't. But I do think that I, I want to think that that is rare. I don't think that it's rampant. I think it's rare, right? So we're trying to create a policy that kind of captures instances that are these one-offs, you know? That's my hope, I think. Mm -hmm. And your trust. Yeah, because inherently I do. I mean, yeah. Thank you. But well, I think we also, you know, we've you haven't talked about the policy in depth, but I think there are some areas that we need to look at. For example, our policy says the process may also provide opportunities from input from students, parents, or guardians 
but state law clearly says we should promote it. So I, to me, that's an easy, low-hanging fruit. We should bring that in alignment. But I think really what I think would be a good direction to send staff. You know, I've already expressed my concerns about some of the buckets of areas that we should look at, but in our second paragraph of our policy says the district's curriculum shall be aligned with the district's vision and goals for student learning, board policies, academic content standards, common core state standards, state curriculum frameworks, state and district assessments, graduation requirements, you know, goes on and on. And I think the question we're asking is, does our process do that? And, and maybe what we should be doing is asking our professional staff, which the cabinet and also our teachers, to take a look at this and saying, are we doing that? We know we have some gaps in the process. How do we fix that? What areas? We didn't get into all the areas of the actual practice, but we have professionals that we trust in our cabinet. We have professionals that we trust in our teachers and staff. Maybe that's the direction we do. And when we get that information back from them, then we can make decisions on whether we want to execute those changes. In the meantime, we have lots of parents um, and teachers that have given partial input, maybe would like to give some more input, and perhaps we can put some sort of input form on our website and promote to both our teachers, our staff, and our parents in that area, what could we do to do better? And then you use all that input plus what you've heard here to do that analysis and come back with some recommendations. Does that sound reasonable? Because they, they've heard all of our concerns, they meaning our administration. We've, we know sort of the objectives of what we want to do. And we aren't the professionals to be doing that actual physical work. I would feel comfortable doing that. So I'd like to hear from the rest of you what you think about that. So you're proposing the second paragraph, they go back and they tell us if they're doing everything. Is that what you just said? I think that plus incorporating some of the concerns we've had here and really looking at the practices. Let's let them get with the principals and their site teams and say, okay, we know what you've been doing. We didn't really get in depth here. We had the questions, but let's really have them go in depth and say, okay, we know where Ed Code wants, uh, we know what Ed Code wants us and the board to do. We know what our policy is. Let's look at that one section. Are we really doing that? And then, but also from practices, what can we do? Where can we make changes to come in line with this policy as we line it up with the state law? Well, let me ask, what do you think they think your concerns are? You just said they've heard our concerns. What, what concerns do you think they're trying to solve right now? Well, I listed four very specific ones. So, and I know I've seen them feverishly writing, so I'm assuming they're, and we have it on video so they can read it, watch us time and time again to get it. But I think, and then us as individual board members, we should talk to our superintendent and express any further concerns so that we can have a comprehensive review. I just, what I don't wanna do is I don't want us in a live meeting trying to pick a day where we're gonna wordsmith and try and craft policy on the fly. That's not our job. That's not what our policy on board policy says. And I think that's really not the job of the board. So if we have specific concerns, we share them either now or directly with the superintendent and we give them the charge to go out there and do this and come back to us. Either come back to us with one option or perhaps two options or three options if there's multiple avenues of going, then we make the decision and then they execute it. And if you look at our board policy on policies, it's pretty much the exact steps we should be taking as we go through our policy issues. I was just gonna follow up and ask Dr. Moore, what are you hearing? us ask for if you could kind of send that back and then we can say sure yes, that's right sounds good <laughs> checking for understanding i love it it's a great teacher move um okay so we've been talking about notice and time something that heidi talked about and just what does that timeline look like 
so that when we're asking for involvement, it's in a meaningful way and the chance for it to be thoughtful. Um, also looking at the process and parameters for what happens when people aren't all in agreement and how does that move forward, kind of clarifying and having that process is something, um, Julie, you mentioned. Um, Pete was looking at a process or timeline of what is the process to get the 600 courses through while still allowing the new courses. Um, so just even outlining what is that, I don't know if it's a flow chart or a timeline of sorts. Um, while also looking at um, promoting parent involvement okay, and even possible adjustments to the policy around that, so there's clarity. Um, building in the structure for approval, engaging our, our people, the right people, building on their strengths while still keeping some measure of just-in-time learning. Several of you mentioned that, so good. I think that goes to clarifying those tiers, whether there's adjustments in there. I think there's some room for clarity and improvement, um, but still keeping that concept for just-in-time learning that we wanna keep that opportunity when appropriate. Um, and also looking to improve the SILT process in some fashion so that there's that structure, openness, transparency, and that it's it's respectful of all the people involved. They're not feeling, you know, oh, you have to leave, or you know, that it's not welcoming. We want it to be welcoming, and that's part of that process of being open and transparent. Um, I also appreciated the comment around looking at it from a district perspective, not just sites. I think that's partly how we got to where we are because there, we have been so autonomous at sites. Just is how is the natural evol evolution of our district. Um, but we're at a place where it's appropriate to centralize and have some standard processes um, for clarity. Um, Marla was sharing some concerns around, you know, what are those parameters and guardrails? Is the policy working? Um, some questions around content relative to the sex ed code and opting out. And, um, and going back to that concern that we heard from our input gathering as well is choice versus required. Needing to really come to that clarity because um, that may be applicable to some of the quote unquote inappropriate or objectionable content that we've been discussing. Again, the wording, we need to figure out what is that right word to talk about, but is it choice? Is it excerpted? Is it required? Um, an interesting thing that several of you have mentioned is, is that option for parents to opt out really there? And I think we, that, that goes back to is what's the district process? Because sites or departments may be more clear or inviting that more than others. And so it may just be this invisible thing that as teachers, as educators, we know it's there, but maybe it's not as super clear. And, and some mentioned, you know, I've, I've seen it happen where uh, in a syllabus, I'll say these are the five novels we're reading, or maybe here's the one class novel and then we have choices, you know, but having some type of a clarity that is part of that centralized process. So there is that invitation of, hey, take a look. These are the books for this semester. And if there are concerns, I invite that conversation. Inviting it versus having a process that there's that distinction. So I think those are some of the things that I'm mulling over listening to the conversation tonight. Um, getting feedback from is this working, is this not, coming back with some ideas based on this conversation as we mull it over and, and work with our teams. Um, I think we could come back with some ideas and... And then April, I think everything you have on slide 20, we don't want to discount what you've brought up as areas to improve. I think we're just adding to that list. Appreciate that. And so when, as I was recapping from, you know, and verbally processing here, anything I got wrong or that you want to enhance that maybe I didn't get quite right? Invariably, we're all going to go home and think of what we didn't say, and so we'll make sure that we follow up with you uh, individually. But if there's something sticking out right now, um, let April know. But if not, this is not your only opportunity to opine. Yeah, and I, I just want to be really um, aware of the number of things that's on that list plus the list here. And, uh, you know, I think it looked to you to how you'd prioritize that. 
if I were to prioritize it, I'd say start with the big thing, which is are we doing what we say we're doing and what can we be doing to match ed code better? That would be like the, I think the founding principle to start with, but there's a lot on that list. I don't think you can do it all right away. <laughs> yeah, scale the mountain, huh? I want to go back to our student board members now that you've had an opportunity to see kind of what we're thinking. Is there anything you'd like to add that you think would help bring clarity to the process or do you think we are in the general ballpark? How you talked about your website or your forum that you're going to add. You mentioned teachers, staff, parents, but I also do think that you should incorporate students into that as well because Frankly, we're the ones that are being educated here. <laughs> so I do believe that we should have a say in all this as well. I would like to echo that. And also, with this opting out, I think we a lot of us say, like, can we actually read this whole book? Do we have the time to do it when we're reviewing it? But we also live in an age of the internet. And so I think that if you really have some major concern for you, you can look it up on the internet and get a really in-depth um, perspective on it from many nuances. Um, and so if it really is an issue for you, then you can actually look at it that way too. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you both, mm -hmm. especially when we keep you here late on a school night. Anything else, knowing again that this isn't our last opportunity to give our input? I just want to say a few words. So I'm new to the board, so I'm really just absorbing a lot of this information. I just want to say how impressed I am with the presentation and kind of how you outlined, you know, what the issues are and uh, where we can improve and just what the process is in general. And I just want to say what a privilege it is for us to gather like this and exchange ideas and be able to express concerns on both sides and be able to come up with something that's balanced and something that is going to work for the students because that's ultimately what's important here. Um, I do want to say that I appreciate what the teachers are doing. I would echo what Pete said about not necessarily um, tying their hands about supplemental materials because I do feel that that is very relevant in today's world to keep them current and ready for college and just for the real world out there. But also to hear the par parents' concerns. And I think um, instead of focusing on what may be appropriate since that's so hard to, de to define, I think maybe focusing on what is inappropriate and what is explicit and what should not be in the classroom. So I think that's a big focus point in terms of just the curriculum in general, but I really look forward to working with this board on this process. And I think a lot of uh, great ideas were exchanged tonight. So thank you everybody for participating. Marla, anything you wanna add before we get home to our families? Well, you don't have to wait till next time because you have an email and you can meet up with John or April. Well, thank you. I want to thank everyone for being here. I know the, the crowd has thinned. Thank you for those who stuck it out to the end. As I mentioned, this is the beginning of a process, not the end of the process. We want to hear from all of our teachers. We want to hear from our parents. We want to hear from parents on both sides. And then finally, I just want to say thank you. Everyone was very respectful of each other's opinions and we got a lot of input today. Uh, Thank you very much. I think now we're going to move on to our next couple items on the agenda so we can get out of here. So our next item is very easy, board and staff comments. We're going to start with staff. April, you've been talking a lot. You got anything to add? Not for tonight. I would like to just thank our Ed Services team and site administrators who pivoted um, in our professional development day on this past Monday, um, going from on purse on ground. Now with the storms, we went virtual. So just want to say a, a quick note of thanks for that, and thank you for your time tonight. I actually like talking about curriculum, so anytime I'll do coffee too. <laughs> Let's talk. Thank you, John. First, I'd like to thank our tech crew, Mr. Calvo, Mr. Paris, and our student techs, and James for setting this all up tonight. And for all you parents in here, thank you for voting yes on Measure D. That's why this beautiful facility is here at Antelope High School. So thank you for that. Um, I would say I, I really appreciate this discussion tonight because it's been a long time coming. And I think it's the step in the right direction. I've been waiting for this for a few months. April has, and you know, she's been chomping at the bit to get to work on this. 
And there's a couple of thoughts that I've had sitting here. One as a parent in the district and who has a wife as a teacher and spends about four hours every night scouring the internet to try to figure out how to teach an EL kid, a special ed kid, a kid going through trauma, homeless, foster youth and everything else. She's never worked in any other place but full Title I schools where every kid needs something and there is no curriculum for it. So you have to go search for it. Um, and that's important to remember. And I'm glad I heard some validation of that because we would literally be tying the hands of our teachers and in this district would no longer be great. And so we have to value that. I would also say as we go forward, and I'm gonna do this with my team, we have this vision statement here that should drive what we're doing with this. And the first one is high quality academic opportunities. Every high quality academic program in this district, all the success of this district for since I've been here since 2007 and way beyond, was never board approved. It was developed, implemented by teachers. Our AP program, our IB programs, blocked intervention schedules, everything was developed by teachers and implemented by teachers. And we have to remember that everything we're valuing and fighting for, that our parents are fighting for, was developed by teachers. And we have to honor that and continue to honor that because that's how those programs will continue to thrive. And yes, they're going to change them on occasion. And again, I find it interesting, like the intervention schedule, when someone talked about that a year or so ago, that started with just a couple teachers who came back from a conference and they implemented it. Then another school implemented it. And now it's district wide. And people are like, they can't take that from us. Well, that's how it originated. So you can't say teachers can do this, but then they can't do that. So we have to honor that. And then the last one there, remain open, transparent, and accountable. And that's the part that resonates with this process for me. And I think Dr. Moore and her team have done a great job as we have done a great job of making this more transparent and accountable. And I think the accountable piece goes back to guardrails, content, and how we have those discussions about content. And what does that look like? Um, and then that promotion piece, not just notifying on a website, but how do we promote? Because let's be realistic, most people don't look at websites anymore, nor do they even check email. So how are we promoting? I think we could do a better job of that um, in including people in this process. Because ultimately the most important part is the middle, and we have to work in partnership. We say that, it's been in every WASC report, school plan, it's been said as long as I've been in education since the 90s, we have to have partnership. And that partnership is give and take. It's not about winning. It's not about politicizing. It is about partnership. You're going to agree, you're going to disagree, but no one's in this line of work to provide ill intentions to children. And when people start saying that, this isn't the forum. You don't want to be a partner. Then this isn't the place for you to be. You're not trying to partner. You're just trying to vilify and engage in hostility. That's not how this works. That's never going to build trust. Trust is true partnership, and I appreciate um, the board for talking about that. How do we get somewhere in the middle? I think we have good things in place. We can continue tweaking it. We'll probably continue tweaking it and tweaking it some more as our society continues to change. And so I, do, I just appreciate the night. I appreciate our teachers. I appreciate all the parents coming here to Antelope. I waited 16 years to have a board meeting at Antelope, so I'm kind of excited. Um, <laughs> Um, but I do appreciate it, and um, I'm excited for the work, and I know Dr. Moore and her team are going to carry this forward, and I know our teachers are going to do a great job. I just appreciate having the beginning of a conversation. I wish it was longer. I know it's late, though, and I'm, I'm kind of an early morning person, but um, I uh, wish the teacher panel had longer time. I had, I had more questions, I, and and I I enjoyed talking to them. I think um, if we could bring them into the process, this kind of context more also, so parents can hear their perspective. I think that would go a long way. Um, there there was everything that they said was really important to hear, um, and so I'd like to figure out how that could be done, um, and maybe that's a Okay, now I have calm. Now, okay, well, and maybe that's more important than exactly what happens at Silt. I don't know. I think there's some re, there's some work that we can do. I'm just gonna pass. I'll stop. But um, I appreciated the teacher com that teacher part. You just say thanks. Oh, okay. 
You don't have to. I was just going to thank the teachers who came. I don't know if any of them are still here, but <laughs> I agree with Marla that it was great having them, and that's really helpful. And I think for us to understand the why, you know, if we're seeing something that has a low level reading and is explicit, like we just need to have an understanding of what is that educational value. And if the teachers are here and can share with us and we can dialogue, it just breeds a good feeling of transparency and trust and we all are on the same page. So thanks to all of them who came, if any of them are still left and all of you who hung out the whole time too. Thought it was good. <clears throat> Same, same, same. And welcome back. It's my son's last semester, so I'm, go mm -hmm. I'm going through a lot of lasts right now, <laughs> starting with today, starting with this week. So anyway, that's all I had to say, but thanks. It was a good, good, good work for bringing us to this point today. Good work bringing us to this point. I just have a couple quick things. One, congratulations for making it through your first real meeting. We brought it an antelope for our first ever antelope representative on the board we appreciate you being here and being a voice for antelope and then the only other thing i want to say is uh, john and i have been talking about how we might modify our agenda for our board meetings and one of the things that i would like to do is take these board comments and move them up when there's actually people here to hear them because it's unfortunate that um, the people we represent don't get an opportunity to see the things that each of us are doing, well, mostly you guys, uh, doing out at the different schools and doing that, so I think it would be important. So we're considering that. Of course, then I'm going to put time limits on you because it'll be in the way of our work. Uh, but anything else that you think that we can do to optimize our agenda management, please let me or John know because we want to keep working on process so that we can streamline what we're doing. Last thing is, uh, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. And a second. All in favor? All right. None opposed. Let's go home. Thank you, ladies, for being here tonight. We appreciate you. <laughs>